Thank you everybody for joining this webinar on digital humanities in actions. We will be presenting Sampo model and portals for cultural heritage. We are very flattered to see so many people attending this webinar from all con continents of the world actually. Uh, I'm from Heldik and Aalto University and, and uh, I'll start this webinar by presenting the vision, history and realization of the Sampo model and Sampo series of semantic portals. After this presentation, uh, Jouni Tuominen, uh, or after this presentation, uh, Mikko Koho will, will be chairing uh, another session on infrastructures and tools that we have been using on these semantic portals. And then we have a small coffee break. And after that, Jouni Tuominen will be chairing uh, the first session of the 10 Sampo presentations. We'll have another coffee break in the middle and then uh, in the final session we have uh, five Sampo presentations more. And in the end there will be discussion and conclusion session. If you have questions or want to comment something, it might be easier that if, if you write your questions and, and comments in the chat so we can take them from there and, and then answer the, the uh, questions. And, and, and you can, of course, when you, when you are speaking, just unmute your, your, your microphone and video and, and you will be online. So creating the sample model and series of semantic portals for digital humanities. Uh, I will first present a little bit what and why this semantic web and AI for digital humanities actually means. Then small video explaining uh, uh, the linked open data infrastructure that we're working on, as well as the sample portals, the main topic of this webinar. I think the main takeaway of this seminar is that these sample portals illustrate a paradigm shift in 20 years from publishing texts to serendipitous knowledge discovery and artificial intelligence applications. In the end of the presentation, there will be time for questions and answers. So what is digital humanities? In our mind, we are applying computer science to problems in humanities and social sciences, but also the other way around. Humanities and social sciences give us very interesting research problems in which we can develop computer science ahead from a methodological point of view. Uh, linked open data and semantic web, this is a mega trend that's happening on the web. And uh, what is happening here in on the semantic web is actually that we have now two webs. We have the traditional web, web of pages for humans, where we have pages and, and we can uh, jump from one page to another by using the hyperlinks as ordinary. Uh, but there's also this web of data that we are speaking more in this webinar. People are publishing linked data, data sets on the web and interlink them with each other in order to enrich the data. So you have here the famous photo or, or illustration of, of the linked open data cloud where Wikipedia is a kind of central data set and all these bubbles here are data sets and, and they are interlinked with each other as illustrated in this graph. For example, war sample is one bubble here that is then interlinked with some other data sets in order to uh, make interlinking between, between the larger context available. Why linked data is, is important? I think there are at least three major reasons that we're working here on these issues. Uh, first, by data linking, we can enrich everybody's data in a collaborative way. So everybody wins by collaboration. Then uh, by using this technology, your data can be made more valuable by using the FAIR principles. So we are creating findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data. And finally, because now the computer can understand the com contents of the web, we can make more intelligent applications for the humans to use. So I have a video here, or actually two videos to illustrate the idea. Science is vast, and so is the concept of AI. Though based on mathematical thinking, AI also has a lot to offer to social sciences through multidisciplinary approaches. For example, gathering of information. 
Very often, search engines give irrelevant or uninteresting results, or they can be out of context. The computer cannot comprehend what particular documents on the web are about. To provide more intelligent access for information, scientists have created the semantic web, where contents on the web are made comprehensible to the computer. Another major benefit of the semantic web is that uh, it can aggregate data from different data sources, even across language barriers. So we can get more data into the systems and in an interoperable way, so that people can be served with, with not only more intelligently the data, but also more data. A worldwide pioneering semantic web concept has been developed in cooperation with the University of Helsinki and the Aalto University. It is a series of 12 semantic portals, each dedicated to a certain context. For example, the biography sample is a collection of over 13,000 biographies held by the Finnish Literature Society. These were transformed into a linked data service and enriched by linking it to the data of 16 external sources, such as Wikipedia, libraries, museums, and other archive collections. If you click on a particular biographical subject, you get a lot of interlinked, rich content about them. You can compare their lifeline on an interactive map, or you can select different life events from a list composed from different biography sources. We have integrated uh, the search and exploration systems with data analytic tools. So you not only get the possibility of, of search and explore the data, but also do data analysis and find interesting patterns of, of knowledge in the data. For example, you can compare the places of birth and death of generals and clergymen in Finland in the 19th century and find out that generals moved a lot more than the clergy, who tended to remain in one place. We are using artificial intelligence for solving problems, so not only do we provide the user with the tools for solving the problems, but we can provide him with artificial intelligence that can solve the problems by itself. I am Eero Hyönen from the Helsinki Center for Digital Humanities, Helsinki, University of Helsinki and Aalto University. This short presentation overviews our work on building a national link to open data infrastructure and applications for digital humanities. The work has been done at the Semantic Computing Research Group SECO in collaboration with computer scientists, researchers in humanities and social sciences, cultural heritage organizations and companies. First, the vision of building a semantic web infrastructure in Finland is outlined. After this, work on ontology and linked data services are presented, as well as the sample series of semantic portals based on them. This work demonstrates a paradigm shift for publishing cultural heritage content from printed texts up to artificial intelligence-based systems. Our work has been driven by the vision that a shared linked open data infrastructure is needed for creating cross-domain, cross-organizational cultural heritage of applications for digital humanities. Creating such an infrastructure started in 2003 in the National Ontology Service Project FinOnto that lasted 10 years and was funded by some 50 Finnish organizations. The need for an ontology infrastructure became evident when we created the Museum Finland system that aggregated and published collection data from different Finnish museums. After the National Ontology Project, the focus spread into linked data services, data analysis and digital humanities research. Today, our work forms the initiative Linked Open Data Infrastructure for Digital Humanities in Finland. We work on modeling history-related phenomena and contents using the event-based approach, on developing linked data and ontology services, and on open source tooling. For this purpose, ontologies for historical places, persons, times, events, and keyword concepts are needed over and over again. We also foster education related to these technologies. To test and demonstrate the feasibility of the infrastructure, a series of 12 semantic portals has been created and six new ones are underway. 
We call them SAMPO portals because they are based on the so-called SAMPO model for publishing and using cultural heritage data on the semantic web. The SAMPO model is based on a shared linked data infrastructure, a collaborative data publishing business model, tools for building user interfaces, and a model for solving research problems. The name Sampo comes from the Finnish epic Kalevala, where the mysterious Sampo artifact is a metaphor for amazing technology that brings its owner riches and good fortune. The Sampo portals have had millions of users. For example, book Sampo on pixel literature data deployed by the Finnish public libraries had 2 million users last year. War Sampo on the Second World War history based on contents from the National Archives, Defense Forces, and other organizations, has had over 740,000 users. Name Sampo, containing 2 million historical Finnish place records. Biography Sampo, with over 30,000 biographies of the Finnish Literary Society. And War Victim Sampo, on Finnish Civil War data, have had tens of thousands of users each. The latest Sampo in 2020, Mapping Manuscript Migrations is a transatlantic system for aggregating and publishing data of over 200,000 medieval and Renaissance manuscripts from the Bodleian Library of the University of Oxford, Schoenberg Institute at the University of Pennsylvania, and Institute for Research and History of Texts in Paris. At the moment, six new samples are being developed. For example, Find Sampo is a system targeted for archaeologists and citizen science metal detectorists using the collections of the Finnish Heritage Agency, including collaborations with the British Museum and the Pan-European Ariadne Plus project. Law Sampo publishes Finnish legislation and case law on the semantic web in collaboration with the Ministry of Justice. The Parliament Sampo system is being developed in collaboration with the Parliament of Finland. Our goal is to publish Finnish parliamentary discussions and related data in an intelligent web service for researchers of political culture and the general public. The Sampo model and portals aim at making a paradigm change in publishing and using cultural heritage content on the web. The contents are published as linked data and also integrated seamlessly with intelligent tools for data analysis. In our vision, Artificial intelligence should help the user in solving research problems and also in finding new ones using creative AI methods. It would be important that the system can also explain its reasoning. In Douglas Adams' novel, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the computer was asked, what is the meaning of life? The answer 42 may be right, but the researcher in humanities would also like to know why. In my mind, a reusable, shared, linked, open data infrastructure is the key for successful digital humanities work. More information, publication, and links to different samples and infrastructure services can be found on the home pages of the Semantic Computing Research Group. Okay, thank you. That was the presentation. Uh, if you have any, any questions, we have perhaps time, time for one. If not, let us then proceed to the next session. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Mikko Koho. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Heldig. And I will chair the first session about infrastructure and tools. So we have three presentations in this session. And if you have any questions about the presentations or around them, please write them in the chat. And I will then ask the questions at the end of each presentation, if there is time. And if there is not enough time to answer all questions, the presenters then could answer the questions after their presentations in the chat. Um, so the first presentation is linked open data infrastructure for digital humanities in Finland, and it will be presented by Jouni Tuominen. Thank you, Mikko. 
So, so I hope everyone can see my screen now. Okay, so hello everyone. So I'm Jouni Tuominen. I'm from uh, Heldic, the Helsinki Center. Sorry about that. Helsinki Center for Digital Humanities and also from Semantic Computing Research Group from Aalto University. Uh, the topic of this presentation is linked open data infrastructure for digital humanities in Finland, or the acronym LODI for DH, which is kind of the initiative that we are, we are where we are building this infrastructural work. So, I will start uh, start very briefly by setting the context, which Air already, of course, started nicely in the first presentation. So, uh, and my my uh, message here, or or what I'm trying to uh, communicate, is uh, why digital humanities needs linked data, or why linked data is so beneficial for for digital humanities research, and also, of course, in wider context, in publishing publishing data openly in interoperable way. Uh, then after that I will move on uh, more concretely to describing this vision and work in progress that we have been doing for actually quite many years already in, in SECO and HELDIC. So, so how are we actually building this kind of linked data infrastructure and how, how do we see what is needed there. So in, in digital humanities uh, as by definition, the research is uh, quite data driven uh, by nature. So it means that the research needs data, of course. Uh, and in humanities, quite many research is based on, on uh, data coming from different cultural heritage sources. So for example, in this, this uh, slide, we can see the national epic of Finland Kalevala, which is in the middle. Uh, so, uh, all the contents in, in this field can be quite heterogeneous, but they are also, of course, interlinked implicitly. So, for example, Kalevala, uh, it has inspired many pieces of, of arts, for example, paintings. And these paintings, of course, have some painter. And then we have the biographies of the painters, which are of interest in, in when we are dealing with this whole field if we want to get this kind of bigger picture of the data uh, data system. Uh, similarly, there are some literature work that uh, deals with uh, Kalevala. Uh, then there, there are events of Kalevala which are described in different sources. Uh, uh, these uh, people who have created these pieces of art, for example, they have they have been born in some places and they have lived in some, some, some buildings, which can be described as well, of course. Then there are museum item collections and all this can be visualized on maps and so on and so on. So the point here is that everything is quite interlinked, but they are in quite different. They are quite different like from the start. So videos, uh, texts, paintings and so on. Another uh, characteristic of this field is that these different different data contents are produced by different organizations. So for example, museums, galleries, archives, libraries, citizens even, land survey organizations. So all of these different organizations, they naturally have their own systems to publish the data and their own ways to organize the data. And what it means from research perspective, it's, it is that it Quite difficult all these things, uh, unless we somehow describe them in a machine processable way so that computers can help the human in this process. And here, linked data is one of the solutions which we emphasize here. Uh, it's based on this. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee's five-star data publishing vision. And if we start from the bottom, so uh, the starting point for, for publishing data in an interoperable and, and 
easy to use format is that, well, you just publish data in some format, whichever format. That's the first, first star. Then the next phase is you give some kind of structure for the data. So you describe the different attributes of the data, for example, put them in an Excel sheet. So there are different columns for each different attribute. Like if we are describing a person, we can say that he, his first name is, is Akseli, last name is Gallen Kallela. He was born on this date in this place. Uh, he created these pieces of, of art and so on and so on. Uh, then the next, the third star is when you publish the data in an open, openly licensed format. So, for example, CSV, kind of a text file instead of Excel, Excel format. Then now we are actually moving more, more to the actual linked data world. So the fourth star is about giving identities for these pieces of information. So instead of just talking about Axel Gallenkalala, we can give him a global unique URI, which then identifies him in every data content that deals with uh, him. And then fifth star finally is given when we link these different data sets together using these identifiers shared. So this is the big picture about linked data. And now, uh, Last point is that when data is published in this way, everything, uh, all the data sets which refer to each other, they get connected, so enriched by each other. And then it's quite easy to make this kind of queries for this data. So one could see this, this globally aggregated data as one giant data space or database. So now let's move on the our vision for this linked data infrastructure in Finland. So what is needed? Well, firstly, we need some kind of metadata models. So how to describe the data in interoperable way. And also ontologies or other kinds of vocabularies uh, to describe or to refer to these individuals. For example, Axel Gallengallela, he needs an identifier. So for that, we need ontologies. And once we do this, then data is harmonized and easier to process with shared tools. The second point is different kinds of do tools for creating this kind of data and also for processing. For example, if a researcher has access to some data, data set which is not in linked data format, he can himself or herself do this kind of processing to enrich the data and create it in a more easily processable way. So for this, we need ontology services on one hand. So how to publish and access these ontologies. Uh, then we need linguistic and other kinds of processing tools. So for example, how to, how to extract information out of uh, purely text content. And third part in tools is linked data publication services. So in order to access this data by other, other people, uh, it has to be published somehow. And then perhaps the most interesting part from the research point of view is the actual analysis and visualization tools, which, which today we are presenting in the form of uh, 10 different samples, actually. So now I will briefly go through these different points here. So metadata models, uh, for example, here we can see one example. Uh, this is called Psydoc CRM. This is an event-based uh, data model, which can be used for describing quite uh, many different kinds of information items. So it means it's very general. Uh, so it's suitable for many cases. For example, here we are describing an event called Crimea Conference. So so Churchill, Roosevelt and uh, Stalin were meeting and discussing that the reorganization of Europe after, after the war. So here we can see that activity. So the event itself is the thing we are describing. And it actually, it uh, connects together different other kinds of entities. So we can, for example, say that three actors participated in this event. And then here we are referring to the identifier of the actor. So we are not just saying that Churchill was part of this. We are say, saying that Churchill as uh, described in this 
uh, get the vocabulary called ULAN uh, with this uh, local identifier. So we are now referring uniquely to this actor. Similarly, we can say that this event took place at the Alta or, or near Yalta, and here we refer to the identifier of, of Yalta. And it's, uh, it's actually also this kind of URI, which looks like a web address. Then we can say that the event took place uh, in February 45. Uh, then we can also connect other kinds of uh, entities, so like kind of other information objects like images and documents that were produced in this event. And this way everything gets connected. And how, how is this then uh, done or what is needed for this kind of modeling? Well, we naturally need these ontologies where these actors and places and times and so on come from. So the idea here is that we harmonize and standardize the references to these actors. So instead of just saying Tchaikovsky, we use the URI and similarly for other ontologies as well. And of course, different ontologies have different needs for visualizing them, for example, for places. Natural way is to put them on map and this helps the user to understand the ontological concept of some place and to disambiguate them uh, between. So for example, the same place name can, can uh, be on many places in maps, but the map helps us to disambiguate. So when we have the ontologies, we also need some kind of mechanisms to publish them so that they can be used in other information systems and by data producers. So we have uh, created this Onki ontology service years ago, and it has been then uh, further developed and, and taken into produ uh, production level deployment by National Library of Finland. So now it's called Finto system. And last year, Finto had about 280,000 users on the site. So it's quite widely used. And, and for example, the users made 1.9 million page loads per year, per that year. And the programmatic app API access. So for example, the museums that, that use Finto to describe the contents, it has been used uh, for, for 32 million requests. So we are very glad to see this kind of infra is actually taken into use on national level in Finland. Then we, we think that uh, general linguistic processing tools are needed. So, for example, if we have a text content, a, a traditional text document, for example, PDF or Word file, how can we create linked data out of this? Well, we need uh, general language processing tools. For example, we know how to, uh, uh, for example, for Finnish language, we need some kind of lemmatization. So, because the language is so inflected, highly inflected, we need to get the base forms of the words in the first place. So we not need this kind of like quite low level processing tools. And then after that, we can move on to, to like more advanced layer. So we can try to identify different kinds of entities from these texts. Then we need the publication method for these data sets, which we are we have built this linked data Finland platform, which can be used for publishing any linked data dataset. And for example, the Sampo datasets for the Sampo portals, which are uh, presented today, they are published in this, this linked data service. And what it means, it, it means that when data is available here, directly into the, the data. And actually these Sampo systems are built by utilizing this linked data service SparkLA endpoint. So anyone could, could create their own samples based on this technology. And finally, analysis and visualization tools for the researchers once the data is in a good format so that the tools can be used, shared tools for different data sets. For example, we can create these map-based visualizations, which are quite powerful. Then, for example, for, for actors, we can create these networks 
different kinds of networks based on different criteria. So we can see the connections between uh, people or we can make these traditional infographics which, which are actually quite easily created by writing Sparkle query and then we use this for example Google toolkits for getting these dynamic visualizations. And these, these uh, will be discussed today in more details. So as a recap, uh, we need ontologies and metadata models, then we need tools for data creation and processing, and actually the next presentation will be about this linguistic processing by Minna Tamper, and then these analysis and visualization tools which are covered today in these 10 different Samba portal presentations and this Samba UI general framework which powers the Sambos by Esko Ikkala. So thank you. Thanks, Joni. So now if there's any questions, uh, anyone could write them in the chat. So there was one question, but I guess it's not really about the presentation so much. So maybe Joni can uh, answer it in the chat directly. Uh, but I was wondering if I ask one question, uh, how specific is, is all this um, to Finland now, like the presentation is about the linked open data infrastructure in Finland and uh, are there other similar initiatives in other countries? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so, so the technology here of course is not tied to Finland, but there are some specifics related to Finland. For example, if we are creating these ontologies of historical persons or places, and because we are dealing quite many cases with Finnish data sets, the data comes from Finnish places and actors. Mm. As far related to other countries building this kind of infrastructures, I think Finland is actually quite ahead of the game. So I haven't seen uh, like these widespread initiatives, this uh, like covering all the different aspects and this kind of general, general initiatives. Uh, but for example, for cultural heritage, there are lots of different kinds of initiatives, of course. Uh, for example, in, in Netherlands, they have been building quite quite many nice systems for, for years, for example. Okay, thanks. So maybe we'll then move on to the next presentation, which is extracting knowledge from Finnish texts and it's presented by Minna Tamper. Uh, you seem to be muted, Minna. Minor technical difficulties, but let's try again. Okay, here we go. So my presentation is about extracting knowledge from Finnish texts and I'm Minna Tamper, a doctoral candidate from Aalto University and I've been working in the Semantic Comp Computing Research Group. So I'm going to talk briefly about the use cases where we have used different kinds of entity or knowledge extraction methods and then I'm going to show you some services that we have and finally if you have questions I can answer your questions. So briefly about some of the use cases that where we have used knowledge extraction. First of all we have the war sample portal. The war sample portal enables study of war history and destinies of people in the war from different interlinked perspectives. And here we have an example from the Kansataisteli article perspective where we have facets where you can browse based on different topics that have been extracted from the magazine articles. And on the center you have the magazine articles which you can open and read. We have also done some subject indexing for these 
articles where you can also search them based on some keywords we have extracted. A second use case we have had is the biography sample portal. Uh, biography sample portal is a portal that enables anyone easily to browse and study information in biographies and related data sources. Um, in the biography sample, we have um, extracted information from the biographical texts by first transforming the biographical texts into, for, into RDF and linked data, from which we have been able to do, uh, identify named entities such as people, places and organizations at times. Then we have, <clears throat> based on this information, we have created this sort of a contextual reader application, for example, where we can highlight the people mentions and place mentions and provide some extra information such as who link, in addition to links to these, to the people's biographies, we can also show briefly who they are and when they lived and an image of the person or a map of a place. Um, in addition, as we can extract these named entities and people mentions from the text, we can create this sort of uh, networks that can help to visualize the references in the biographical texts, or we can create basically uh, a view where we can study the language use of these biographical texts. For example, let's say um, we can take a specific profession and study the language use in that profession. On the, in the biographies of that profession. And a third sample that we have that we have used uh, knowledge extraction is the law sample portal. Uh, the law sample portal it consists of different search applications that can be used to find different kinds of legal texts. Uh, in here we have an example from the API application um, where we have you given an application, the text, and then we have extracted not only entities such as references to statutes and court decisions, but also times and some words. And by clicking on those words, you can get an explanation of those words, what it means, which is quite useful if you have very complex terminology that is not um, as such easy to understand for a regular person or may, it may be also some domain information such as some computer science terminology that's not easy for some for the professionals of other domains to understand. In here we have also found for this text related uh, case law texts that are similar to this and on the top you can see on the bright colors all the or on the pastel colors all the nice things that we can find from the text if it contains those and we have plenty of applications where we use <coughs> that we use to find these these entities such as Finber, uh, Finer or some or Arpa in addition to identify and then we can try to <coughs> vote for example which one of the uh, interpretations of the entity is a correct one. That is, if we have a text where you have, for example, Nokia Corporation mentioned, it can also be identified as Nokia Place. So in case these applications determine, most of these applications determine that Nokia refers to the Nokia Corporation and not Nokia Place, in this given context, in this text, it will uh, vote that each different application gives a different interpretation and based on what's the most popular interpretation of if Nokia is a place or if Nokia is a company reference, it will decide on this. And the, this result that you can see in here is the, uh, what the application has decided in the end. But also we have other applications which can uh, find similar text as in the bottom we have the similar case law documents that relate to this one that we have here, which is an abstract of a case law. So these applications that we've used in these use cases can be found collectively in a 
place where we collected, but here are a few other notable mentions that we have created and added into the portal that we, I will show you briefly. Uh, we have a uh, Hengo, which is a person name ontology based on Finnish digital agencies name data and person name data collected from other samples that are based on matricial information, for example. Then we have a gender identifier tool, which can make a sophisticated guess about person's gender based on the statistics of name usage in the Hengo dataset. And finally, we have also this person name identifier, which can a to extract person names from text and enrich them with other contextual information such as we can for example guess what is the gender based on the person name based on the user statistics or we can extract also other information surrounding the name such as maybe a title or lifespan sometimes in the end of the name you have the living the years that the person has lived and here is the NLP service platform where we have collected all these tools that has been mentioned already earlier by Yoni and that has been created where all these applications can be found and tested. We have also API documentation there for each service and they all returned data in JSON format. So you can go in there and test them. What's coming next? Well, we have more services coming, for example, one that will transform text into RDF that we plan to publish, hopefully there. Then we have, um, we are planning to ap apply this method as well to law sample and parliament sample. Then we have uh, other people working on applications such as application for searching, classifying and exploring legal documents based on semantic context to, it's, which is a search application that is based on <coughs> identifying uh, sort of uh, different kinds of situations where people can be and then finding documents related to those situations and plenty of other applications probably as well coming soon once we manage to create them demo services. For more information we have the our home page and then we are also part of the Nexus Linguarum EU cost action where we are also de uh, developing and discussing what we're doing with other EU member states and people from them. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Minna. Is there any questions from the audience? Well, I was wondering, uh, um, these tools, um, you mentioned that they are available there in the, in the nlp.ldf.fi, uh, I, I guess, or, or was that correct? But anyway, uh, that they are available there for testing, but what about if somebody wants to use them uh, for like a production use, for example, are they available somehow for that? Well, currently, the only limitation that we have is that we are using uh, CSC services and there may be some limitations to what we can use there. So if someone wants to use these applications, we have uh, dockerized most of them. And maybe I'm not sure if you only, we have um, published all the Docker, Docker containers, but we can at least give them to someone for if they have a place where they can use them. Yeah. Okay. I can add that, yeah, not all of them are yet dockerized or pub, uh, publicly available as dockers, but we will get there. Okay, and there was a question from the audience. So you mentioned upcoming test, text to RDF tool. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, um, in Biography Sample, we had this uh, transformation from text to RDF, which is that we transform uh, written text of this in that case, we've transformed the uh, biographies of text into RDF. Um, that means that we uh, transform the text into by splitting them into paragraphs, sentences, and words, and recording them into an R RDF uh, SparkQL endpoint where we can query, for example, specific words mentioned in a sentence or sentences that appear in a certain paragraph or paragraphs of a certain 
biography of any textual document. So we are planning to uh, add this tool into the tool set that we have in Anopia LDFE so that everybody can try to transform text into RDF and use it, for example, to find, um, for example, to study word usage in text document collections. Okay, thanks again, Minna. And then let's move on to the next presentation, which is Sampo UI framework for semantic portal interfaces, and it will be presented by Esko Ikkala. Okay, thank you, Mikko. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm a fourth year doctoral candidate at the Semantic Computing Research Group, and I will be talking about satisfying information needs, which is one of the central goals in computer science now that we are living in the age of data explosion. And a very successful and general method for satisfying various information needs is faceted search. And to take next steps towards better solutions, our research group has been combining faceted search with ontologies and linked data for almost 10 years now. And after presenting some ideas about that, I will uh, talk about our generic tool, which can be used to build effective user interfaces for semantic portals. And faceted search, the fundamental idea was proposed in the library world already in the 1930s and during the last 20 years or so it has become an extremely popular method for information retrieval especially in digital libraries and e-commerce sites so just to show some examples of how faceted search is all around us i've taken some examples of the biggest online stores today, how they try to satisfy the information needs of their customers. For example, from the Salandos site, we can right away spot the four basic elements of faceted search. Um, first, there are filters or facets uh, that can be uh, uh, used for uh, refining the result set and the term filter and facet are from a user's point of view synonyms but there are some differences from an academic point of view and then of course we have the button for sorting our search results and then there are the number of results and at the bottom normally we have a view where we can browse through the results and then if we switch over to amazon the same four elements are recurring here, as well as eBay. Uh, and finally, I took an example from Alibaba, which is a huge platform for business to business sales services. So it's hard not to use faceted search if you use the web today. But still, there are some challenges of this kind of traditional faceted search and also faceted search is quite hard to implement in practice and it sets a very high requirements on the underlying data and maybe the biggest challenge is that we don't have enough data or enough detailed data or the data is unharmonized so for example in the Alibaba platform, we cannot filter the search genes, for example, my style, probably because the huge number of different suppliers have not provided that information uniformly. Uh, then, how do we handle multiple selections in one facet? If I select here blue and white, what do I mean? 
is it blue or white or do I want genes that are blue and white this always creates some confusion uh, then it would be nice to have some hierarchy for the facets so that I could filter by subcategories for example here it would be nice that I wouldn't limit to filtering by location of India but I would like to filter by some city that is within India. Also the sorting options are usually quite limited for example here I cannot sort the results by by material or style even though I have filters for for style and material. Uh, then the counting of the results is a bit limited. Uh, usually I, I'm able to access the total number of results but here inside this filter I cannot see that how, how many results I would get if I would click beige or brown or black. It would be nice to see those numbers beforehand. So as you may guess, uh, there are some great solutions based for these challenges based on the linked data infrastructure and technologies. And the first one, maybe the most fundamental solution is that in faceted search facets should be based on these domain ontologies that have been mentioned today many times and if we, we are able to do this then we can call this semantic faceted search and on the right you can see an example of an ontology of historical people where the each person is has been given a, a unique identifier then we can use that domain ontology as a very effective filter for the search results of course in practice you actually using these domain ontologies on existing data sets requires plenty of manual and programmatic harmonization and on the right there is an example what happens if we try to do a facet with unharmonized data for example here we try to filter letters by language and if there is no domain ontology of language in use then the facet becomes quite unusable and then if we have these domain ontologies in place many of these domain ontologies contain hierarchical structures and they are very effective when we are want to create hierarchical, hierarchical facets for example filtering by a place within India we can see the full hierarchy of the Getty thesaurus of geographic names here used as the basis for this facet and then of course if we have a domain ontology for each, each facet then the sorting of, of results by any any property we have on the data is quite trivial to implement and then about the result count with the, uh, with the probably implemented domain ontologies we can show both the total number of results and then we can calculate beforehand all the hit counts for different solutions so, uh, for different uh, selections within this facet so I don't have to click silk in order to know that there are 91 results for the material silk and then about the fourth basic element of faceted search which is the results view uh, 
the normal or the default result view is usually to show all, all the results as a table or as a grid, which, for example, many e-commerce sites are using. But we can expand this into multiple different views, result views with the same result set. For example, we can create different kind of maps or try to visualize the uh, movement based on, on two, two locations and then we can create statistics or networks or animation visualizations and these are all based on the same result set you can see here and the same facets you can see here on the left. So now as a final result on the black text you can see the traditional faceted elements of faceted search and on orange you have the kind of the linked data extensions that we can put on top of, of the traditional faceted search if we use domain ontologies for the data. So the end result is semantic faceted search combined with data analysis. And next I will show you the tool how these ideas can be packaged into a reusable software framework which we call the Sambo UI framework. So these ideas have been bubbling under in developing these sample portals since 2012, but of course all these technologies for building user interfaces are evolving, so we have to update our frameworks. But the basic idea is that the datasets are very big, we have to be able to provide the user different distinct perspectives to the underlying data, then we have to be able to search using semantic faceted search, but also free text search and geospatial search. And we have to be able to do all kinds of data analysis for the results we get from these search paradigms. And then it has seen to, be, to create an homepage for each entity of interest into these data sets. And then we have to want to integrate all kinds of external data sources like maps And here I have tried to broken down the, the user interface into three very basic views. On the semantic portals, we usually have the portal landing page, which contains links to different faceted search perspectives. We can create as many perspectives as, as we want. And then the third, main view is the home page for each entity. So this is a pretty simple structure and these views then can be built using a selection of about 120 ready to use user interface components that have been developed. For example, there are many various components for the facets and many, many components, different components for displaying the search results. And well, Sambo UI is targeted for software developers and it's kind of a starting base of a modern JavaScript web application and it's complemented with the read-only API for actually accessing the linked data. And I don't I won't go into the technical details here. All the code and pretty comprehensive documentation is available on the GitHub site as well as the code as an open source, with an open source license. And there are already quite many portals, uh, the three portals actually that have been already published that have been built using this framework, named some were published in 2018 and then these later portals. And 
rest of these are in the making and all of these portals will be presented more thoroughly in the later presentations today. And also there are a few examples how the Sango UI framework has been used by the University of Bergen and Norwegian mapping authority in 2019 they did this prototype on Norwegian place names and also Bingsoft had has made some prototype implementations using the framework. And the future directions of how we are developing this framework are kind of tied to these future samples and how they are being de developed in the future years. Okay. I will end here. Thank you for listening. Okay, thanks Esko. So again, if anyone has some questions, you could write them in the chat. I guess we have a few minutes for those as well. Yeah, I was I was thinking um, how difficult and how much work is it for someone who now would be interested in, in trying this out to, to set it up uh, with, with some linked data that they would already have. I would say that if you already have linked data available in a Sparkle endpoint, then setting up a new portal using Sambo UI is pretty easy. If you read the documentation, you can manage to do it in a, in a day or in two days to set up a completely new portal for your data. But of course, the most difficult work is, is to actually harmonize the data, especially when, when you're combining data from multiple sources. Yeah, thanks. So if there's no further questions, I think we can have coffee break now and then continue, I guess, in about 10 minutes from now, I would imagine. So around uh, 15 past. Thanks. Okay, welcome back uh, to Digital Humanities in Action seminar. I hope everyone has had their coffee now. So the next session will be Forging 10 New Sambos part one and I will be chairing it. So in this session, we will have five different samples presented. Uh, and we start with biography sampo, biographies on the semantic web. And the presenters are Eero Hyvänen and Kirsi Keravuori. Thank you. Okay, I hope you can see it now. So uh, I'm Eero Hyvönen and I will be presenting with Kirsi Keravuori biography sample biographies on the semantic web. Uh, first, uh, Kirsi Keravuori uh, will, from, from the Finnish Literature Society, will tell us a little bit about the underlying core data set that we are using, that is the national biography collections. After that, the biography sample portal will be presented what it is and, and what it represents in, in a larger setting. And then finally, I, I have a few examples of using the biography linked open data service for digital humanities research. So Kirsi Keravuori, if you unmute your connection, you are free to go. Uh, thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, my name is Kirsi Keravori, and I'm the head of the Biographical Center at the Finnish Literature Society. And I've been working with uh, Eero and his excellent team for several years now on the biography sample. In short, we have provided the uh, biographical content, the databases, the texts, uh, biographical expertise when needed. And then Aaron and his colleagues at Alta and Heldig have been in charge of, of uh, the portal, the, the sample portal and the tools. 
Would you please give me the next slide? Thank you. Now, the result of this um, cooperation, the biography sample, is based on several scholarly connections of historical biographies. The most important of them being the National Biography of Finland, Kansalsbiografia, which has about uh, 6,500 articles of uh, notable Finns covering a period of about uh, 1,000 years. And also several other smaller historical biographies based on occupational groups, such as the Finnish clergy or the uh, Finnish military leaders during the Russian era. And combine these uh, databases and collections of biographies provide information on about 13,000 Finns, their lives, their works, their careers. And our biography sample has been has given us tools to tr transform these collections of biographies, these individual lives, into a source and a set of tools for the study of uh, uh, prosopography, the study of groups. Our biographical data has been enriched by harvesting many exter external data sources, such as other sample portals or the National Library's collection database, Wikipedia, and so on. Um, Biography sample offers tools now for historians and also for other humanities scholars for network analysis, for language analysis, uh, statistical and visualization tools, as well as prosopographical tools for the analysis of groups. Uh, the user can easily create maps or timelines, life charts, or network graphs. I'm showing you this uh, network graph because it's one of my favorite tools. Network analysis is something that historians have always been doing with pen and paper. So it's, it's been very uh, demanded a lot of work. Now you can do it just by clicking a button. But here's one example of these uh, uh, network graphs. This is uh, the medieval Swedish queen, Blanca of Namur. And uh, it includes on the right hand side, her connections in her own lifetime, mainly with the Swedish nobility. But also on the left hand side, it shows Blanca's afterlife. Uh, the connections and the interest in artists in her story in the 19th century when she was painted and, and uh, literature was uh, written about her. Uh, this is just one example of these tools that are based in a new way in our uh, biographical texts. This is all for now. I give the floor to you, Erano. Okay, thank you. For this introduction. Uh, I will show what biography sample is by a video. Can you hear? Uh, we can hear, but we cannot see the video. Biographical. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll reconnect. Perhaps it's. I'll try again. Okay, tell, tell if something doesn't work. Biographical dictionaries are scholarly resources used by the public and by the academic community alike. 
Their biographies usually combine a lengthy text with a supplement of basic facts, such as family, education, works, and so on. Biographies are an invaluable information source for researchers of history, but are available only as text for humans' readers and not as data for digital humanities applications. Biography Sampo makes a paradigm shift in publishing and using biographical dictionaries on the web based on linked data. The idea is to provide the user with enhanced reading experience of biographies by enriching contents with data linking and reasoning. In addition, versatile tooling for biographical research of individual persons as well as for prosopographical research on groups of people are provided. The system is based on a knowledge graph extracted automatically from a collection of 13,100 textual biographies written by 980 authors. The data was enriched with data linking to 16 external data sources, and by harvesting external collection data from libraries, museums, archives. The portal was released in September 2018 for free public use and quickly attracted tens of thousands of end users. Biography Sampo is a semantic portal that includes seven application perspectives for using the underlying linked data knowledge graph. By clicking on the first perspective a semantic faceted search view is opened for finding a protagonist or a group of them in flexible ways. Biography Sampo has reassembled for each protagonist a homepage based on the data extracted from the biographies and by data linking to external data sources. Here the homepage of Alil Sarinen, a prominent Finnish architect, is seen with six biographical descriptions and five data analytic views illustrating his life. Biography Sampo has also provided additional recommendation links to various related biographies. The lives are represented as sequences of spatio-temporal events that the person has participated in different roles, based on an extension of the Sidoc CRM data model. For example, here the events of Elil Sarinen are depicted as a list, on a timeline, and on a map. By clicking on another tab the egocentric network of Elil Sarinen is visualized. As an example for using the system for prosopography, let us click on the life maps view on the front page. Now the faceted search can be used for filtering out a target group of interest. Here the generals and admirals of Finland in the 19th century. Their lives are now visualized as blue-red arrows from place of birth to place of death. Clearly, the soldiers moved to the south when they retired as the retirees do today. By clicking on the arrows the biographs about the related persons can be found. Here the arrow to Siberia is due to General Gustav Silferhjelm's biography. The prosopographical views can always be used for two groups or making comparisons. Here the user compare the life maps of the soldiers with those of the clergy in the 19th century. The priests clearly stayed more often in Finland. In addition to visualizations like this the user can also create various statistics of filtered target groups and find out and analyze networks within the groups. It is also possible to analyze the language of the biographies. For example, the words family and child occur often in the biographies of female Finnish members of parliament but seldom in the biographies of men. In yet another application view the user can solve problems using relational search and artificial intelligence. In this view the user formulated the query, how are Finnish artists related to Italy? using selections in the facets on the left. Biography Sampo found out the relations with natural language explanations such as Ellen Danielson Gambogi got in 1899 the Florence City Award. Okay, let's move on to the
presentation then. Okay, what what biography sample is about in the in the big picture is uh, is a, a kind of a example of of how publishing digital humor or publishing cultural heritage texts have had quite a few uh, paradigm shifts from printed text to online systems for searching and exploring to publishing content and linked data with tools for digital humanities and, and then finally to artificial intelligence based systems. So I will not go in details, but I think this is a main lesson that we have learned here. So we started with, with the printing texts. Then the next generation systems that are now in use in, 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 in Finland, for example, are database search engines where you can find biographies for closely reading like this. But then, the, then comes the next generation that, that uh, biography sample is an example of. So we are publishing texts as linked data and, and provide them with tools for digital humanities analysis. So things like this can now be made because we have the biographies available as data. And then finally, we have this automatic knowledge discovery and AI based systems. Keyword here is serendipity, the occurrence of an unplanned fortunate discovery that we hope that our systems are able to provide the user. Uh, in this, the fourth generation system that we are now aiming at the idea is, is that the agent uh, or the tools are not, not passive tools, but they are active intelligent agents that are able to find research questions in the data, not only solve the problems, and also to some extent explain the solutions. So this is also of course very challenging and, and we will be working on these issues for the coming years, I'm, I'm sure, and for the coming decades as well. Uh, biography sample comes actually with two phases, so, so it's not only the biography portal that I explained here, but it's also the Link Data Finland uh, platform based uh, data service and, and you can use it for also your own purposes. You, if you're not happy with the visualizations and data analytic tools that are available in, in the ready to use uh, portal, you can use systems like Google Colab, Jupyter, Yaskui for scripting and, and everything here is, is done based on a Sparkle endpoint. So there's nothing more happening between the data service and the application layer here. That's very important principle that we have always used in our samples here. So there's a coming paper, I, I will just show you some examples. So for example, here is a, is a Google Colab uh, notebook where you can, for example, analyze what is the percentage of women living in, in timeline whose biographies are there in biography samples. So you can see here, for example, the proportion of, of female biographies is increasing very rapidly here, which is of course good. Then you can have this kind of Colab uh, this kind of visualizations of different col uh, uh, correlation matrices, for example, here you can see that, that if the parents of the persons are military persons, then, then it's very likely that, that the children here are military in the area of military service or in the area of politics, for example, or, or children of, of who are doctors, their fathers and, and mothers are typically military or, or medicine. They are never, practically never actually military persons, but, but very typically they are, they are doctors as well. So, so you can see from here that uh, doctors usually, doctorhood goes in family in the medical area. And here's still another example of, of uh, what uh, countries are mentioned in the biographies on a timeline. So you can see uh, a kind of, of connections of Finland to different countries and, and how the importance of the countries change probably in time based on this kind of, of, of analysis of the mentions of, of countries in the biographies. So thank you. Any questions? Yeah, thank you, Aaron Kirsi. I think we have time for one short question. Uh, well, I one, one thing I was, well, let's see, we have something in chat. Okay, so uh, where can I find the API description for biography sample to use in data and other web services? Uh, it's on Link Data Finland service. When you go there, you will find a homepage of, of biography sample data. And uh, there are ready to use, use uh, documentation and, uh, and also, also Sparkle querying system that you can use. But I would, I would use Yaskui. For, for for trying it out. Yeah, 
Thanks, thanks Eeron Kirsi. Okay, it's time to move on. So the next presentation is name sample, which is a workbench for toponomastic research. So Esko Ikkala and Helena Uusitalo will be presenting it. Okay, hello again, Esko Ikkala. Uh, I will be presenting the name sample project, which was conducted in 2018 and 19. And the goal here was to explore new ways to study place names in a digital environment. <laughs> collaboration between three partner organizations. First, the data provider is the Institute for the Languages of Finland. And then we have the digital people from Heldig and Aalto University, and then the humanities people from the Department of Finnish, the Finno, Ukrainian, and Scandinavian studies from the University of Helsinki. And first, uh, I will hand the microphone over to the data provider organization, Helena Uusitalo from the Institute for the Languages of Finland. Hello, here is Helena Uusitalo. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hello, here is Helena Uusitalo. <clears throat> so uh, I work uh, at Name Materials in the Institute for the Languages of Finland. Uh, well, uh, we have uh, large place name collections. They are digit digitized to a database, which is also a part of name sample. Uh, original place name collections have been collected during the past 100 years and they are based on oral sources. The names are mostly uh, traditional countryside place names like names of villages, meadows, lake, lakes, hills and so on. They are collected in the, in the field from Finnish area and the CD Karelia by interviewing uh, local inhabitants, uh, a total of about 2.7 million place names. Collections contain Finnish, Swedish and Sami place names. Uh, in addition, there are some personal names and common nouns which associate with place names. Uh, place names are located on maps. Positioning accuracy is expressed as uh, an exact location as a map grid or several map grids, depending on how large the place is. But uh, the location has not always been known or the map was not av available when place names were collected. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the collections were digitized between 2015 and 17. Uh, the schedule was, was tied. Then um, the, the main information on the entry slips, such as place name, geographical reference, place type, municipality, collector and collection, collection year, were converted uh, into database format and uh, the specific locations were indicated as coordinates. Uh, in addition to Finnish place names, the database will contain Swedish names and Sami place names may be in the future. That database is available in the digital, digital archive Nimi Arkisto and so also in, in name sample. Collections uh, contain valuable information for onomasticians and linguists as well as for uh, historians, archaeologists and folklorist, natural scientist, especially uh, in, in, in an onomastic study, the database makes it easier to research parts of a name, like suffixes or so-called generic parts of a name, and um, also place names in a specific area. Next, please. Uh, a quick glance at an example of an original place name slip. First row, place name in standard Finnish, here Sikokivi, Patchestone, English. Uh, second row, 
the form in local dialect. This information doesn't include to the database. And then location, municipality, uh, reference to the map. Here is an exact location, number two on the map. And place type here, Kivi, stone, and, and other information about the name and the place. And finally, municipality, collector's name, and year of collection. Well, here was my party, and now Esko continues. Okay, thank you, Elena, for the introduction. So, when we started the Name Sample project, we had this great resource of place names, and then we had nice discussions with the uh, onomastic researchers on how do we how do you want to do this toponomastic research in the digital environment? And it, well, the usual thing is that the, the data is not available in a single register. You have to be able to combine data. Then you have to be able to do filtering. Well, faceted search or semantic faceted search is a great solution for that. And then you want to use all kinds of distribution maps and create charts based on the search results and use as many kinds of as possible of historical and current background maps and also it would be an important option to export your search results for further analysis for example to use with gis tools or any other statistical software but first before you can do any proper visualization or analysis, you have to actually create the linked data infrastructure. And for place names in Finland, there are these two, two major sources. The names are archived that Helena presented, about 2.3 million place names, and then the official place name register, which is maintained by the National Land Survey of Finland, about 800,000 places. And these two registers were converted into linked data. But that's enough, not enough, of course, because the data is not compatible. For example, with regards to place types in the names archive, the collectors have had used nearly 15,000 different types for categorizing the places, whereas the official register has only 150 three place types. So we started there and together with the onomastic researchers we created a domain ontology for place types where all these different expressions were mapped by hand by an expert on these official place types. For example, there can be around 100 different expressions of describing a hill and now we know that all, all these different spelling variations and different terms are referring to the same official term, which is a hill. And once we had the linked data infrastructure ready, then it was possible to create the name of a portal for actually answering those toponomastic research questions by using a web browser. And here on the front page, you start by uh, choosing which data sources you want to use. For example, here I have selected the two main data sources, but there could be more also. And then on the left, you have the search functionalities, the text search that will be conducted over all, all of these data sources that I have selected, or then as another option, I can search by a specific geographical area and get all the place names within that area. And here is an example search, which I have done. I searched all the place names, starting with Aya, which is a Finnish slang word for man. And I get a little bit over 2000 results coming from these two sources here and they are rendered as a table here. And now I, I want to do some data analysis task using the heat map, 
result that that's available here. And now I can see clearly that the 2000 search results are concentrated on the Western Finland. And then if I do another search, uh, now I use the word ukko, which is another slang word for man. And I get a little bit over 6000 results and now the heat map tab is on and I can see a clear distinction that these place names are concentrated on the eastern part of Finland. Which is of course due to the different dialect, dialectal regions in Finland. And then an example of how the harmonized place types are in use. Now I have the same 6000 results with the search I just did and then I have two main data sources, some of them are coming from the names archive here. I can see the source and some of them are coming from the place name registry. But still, I am able to filter by place type to Kohoma, which is a hill, which was not previously possible, of course, when combining these two, two huge result, uh, registers. And then, uh, for integrating some external map layers, uh, we created uh, plugins for the map component that we can fetch the dialectical regions in Finland from the Institute for the Languages of Finland's GIS web service. And now I can use these regions to analyze the dialect dialectal borders of the dialectical regions to analyze the search results. And I'm going to also use some historical map sheets that we have been geo-rectifying geo in our previous projects, for example, the Senate Atlas. And I can plot these search results on these historical map sheets, which is a nice way for the studying of the evolution of place names. What has happened in the 1870 and now these place name collections that for example this place name has been collected in the in 1987 and you can see that for some re reason the name of this house has changed and finally uh, i'm able to download the search results as a csv for processing with other tools and here's a quick example of what the raw data actually is. And it's a pretty simple format, one, one place name record is on one row and then you get all the different properties and the exact coordinates if they are available in the original data. Okay. That's all for me. Thank you for listening. And here are some links to get extra information and links to the source code on, on GitHub. Thank you, Esko and Helena. We now have some time if there are some questions from the audience. Uh, I can start by uh, asking about the harmonization of the data sets. So Esko, you mentioned that the harmonization was done through using the harmonized the finish the so uh, about overlapping between the data sets like uh, the actual individual places is there any kind of estimate or would this be possible to do so I mean, if some place is in both data sets and then you make a query and you get two results from, from the different data sets. So how to harmonize this into one whole? Yeah, that is an interesting question, of course. It would be possible to compare once we have the coordinates for individual places, then we can compare, we could compare their names and their place types and their coordinates and if they are very close to each other, 
then we could say that this is really the same same place. And I think uh, the Institute for the Language of Finland has planned of this this kind of work with where they could link the na names archive to the official place name re register, which of course would be of great benefit when you are counting things, so you don't count count one place multiple times. So it's totally po possible, but it, so some of that work can be done semi-automatically, but it, it needs some kind of expert validation also, because there are places which are very near each other, which has the same name, but they are actually different places. So if we would do this totally automatically, there would be quite a lot of errors. Yeah, thank you. So then we can move on to the next presentation. It's war victim Sampo, 1914 to 1922, Finnish civil war on the semantic web. And the presenters are Heikki Rantala and Ilkka Jokipi. Okay, hello. I am Heikki Rantala. I am a doctoral candidate in Aalto University. And I am presenting with Ilkka Jokipi, who is from National Archives of Finland and was the uh, main history expert in the project. Is uh, Ilkka perhaps unmuted and with video? I should be unmuted. Excellent, excellent. So you can you can start. Okay. Hello everyone. I'm Ilkka Jokipi. I'm from National Archives of Finland and I'm here to talk about the background and the pro project for the war victim Sampo. So next slide please. So the uh, war victim Sampo is based on older database and the project for that database was started in 1998 by Prime Minister's Office of Finland and uh, the database provides information about people perished in war-related circumstances between years 1914 and 1922. And the database had a little bit less than 40,000 people in it, and ma majority of them died during the civil war. There, is, there are also some people in the database who died, for example, in the First, first World War and, and some wars after that. And the database hadn't, ha hasn't been updated in many years, and it was updated last time in 2004. And next slide. And, but still, the database has been important for citizens and researchers. There has been more than 1.3 million visitor, visitors in, uh, after the launch of the website. And, more than 70,000 users per year. And the remembrance year of 2018, it more than doubled the use of the database. And, and uh, since people are using it, the database that much, National Archives of Finland receive quite a lot of feedback and corrections. I could say that they arrive here al almost every month. And next slide. And because of those corrections and feedbacks, in 2018, there was a new project started. And, and then the goal of that, of that project was to update the old database according to the corrections and feedbacks. And we also made check that those corrections were correct and in the archival material. And also during the years after the launch of the first, first database, there had been lots of research going on in Finland and, and we received quite an extensive material from researchers, which we also added to the database. Uh, one important part of the project was also to modernize the user interface. And there was also quite a lot of data in the original database, which wasn't shown on the web, website. And now, now we wanted to make everything visible in the in the sample and 
even though there are still some updates to the data, but in general, I think we achieved our goals very well. And I think Heikki can now tell, tell a little bit more about the technical side of this database or new Sampo. Okay, thank you, Ilka. So, yes, I will be mainly talking about the technical aspects. And of course, there are two parts in a way. There's the, the database and we uh, transform the database to this linked open data. And also we made a web application to access the data. And here, I'm sure the data hopefully is more durable. No doubt in 20 years, someone will have to do a new new web application, I'm sure it will get antiquated very soon. That's nature of things. But at the moment, we are the pinnacle of progress. So our, our main object, in a way, is to make the data accessible. And like Ilka said, there were some things that weren't showing for some reason in the old, old data. And of course, there were limited, limited ways to search it. Uh, so we wanted to give ability to search more truly with like 20 different options, different facets. There are also different kind of tools with like, like you have already seen. There are line charts, by charts you will see. And even for the researchers, there's a, it's open data instead of it being somewhere in national archives. It is sort of open, open database that can't be queried by anyone directly, if you like. Uh, for me here, doing the um, pro, uh, transformation of the data, the biggest, biggest question was how the uh, data is so detailed. There's like the information can be related to a person in over like 150 different ways. So just understanding the original documentation and how it's written is a challenge. So let's make it. So while we make it the data for researchers, of course, but uh, like Ilka said, there are many different groups of users. So like uh, there are 70,000 people perhaps using it every year. So most of them are just regular people looking for their uh, relatives perhaps. And the tools need to be accessible for both researcher and useful for researchers, but also for the general public. And hopefully we have done that. And of course, the other, other reason making it accessible, but also the updating the data. And this is not a, not a trivial question. Uh, that's why it hadn't been updated in almost 20 years, because it's not always easy. Um, so the biggest issue in the updating is, of course, while you can update the data, how, how you update the data in such a way that you uh, protect its integrity so nothing gets broken in the data. And you also make it so easy that uh, sort of a humanist history researcher can, can easily do it. And that's uh, not necessarily an easy task. We are still a little bit working it still, and that is a question. Actually, we are working in SECO in many, many different projects. But we, we have solved it somehow at the moment. And of course, uh, this is linked to open data. So you can link uh, to outside sources and from outside sources to here, to the public database. For example, in future, to some genealogical pages could could link here. At the moment, we are linking to uh, place sources and, for example, getting place coordinates in that way. Also, there are Wikipedia links in some cases. And you can see so this is tools for visualization. And you can uh, analyze for research uh, purposes, I think, very easily. So here you can see two age distributions. On the left side, there is uh, people from the red side of the civil war who were from Turku province. And on the right side, there are people from the red side of the civil war 
from Sleepwood province, and there is a five-year difference in median, and the distributions are very different looking. And you can easily find these things just by playing around with with the facets and looking at the different results. However, of course, for like serious research, I would uh, try to use the, then take the data and analyze it truly, but you can find interesting things very quickly, very easily. And I can demonstrate a little bit how I would, I would use it. Um, let's see. And this would be also typical how samples generally are used. So here you can see the front page of the war victim sample. And there are two views still, the main view that is the war victims database basically of 1914 to 1922, and there are a view for battles of the Finnish Civil War. And then looking at the war victims view, there are the search results uh, here at the table, and there are different ways to look at it, and there are over 40,000 victims. Typically, I might search my own name. Rantala, and then there would be, for example, Anton Rantala, and who was someone from the Red South of Civil War and from Heidala. And then there are, that's actually all this additional from all of this data would have been invisible for some reason in the old application, which is actually the reason for that is a little bit unclear. And another way to look at it might be, for example, I was born in Lapua, so we can search people born in Lapua in the data. And there were 54 people from Lapua. And I could look at them here at the table, but perhaps I could sort of visualize them more interestingly as a whole group. For example, pie chart that is now showing the party in the Civil War. And unsurprisingly, people from Lapua tended to be from the white side of the Civil War. The occupation, they usually were farmers, but there were some working people, and so on. I can also look at the line chart. Here, first, there is a AC distribution, and I can see that people from Lapua were mainly from 16 to 26 years old, and they were pretty young on average in the median, so even younger than usually people on the white side of the civil war, not to mention the whole date. And then there's also option for dead date distribution. So we can see that many people from Lapua died on 3rd of April. That I believe was the bloodiest day of Battle of Tampere. And also you can see there are people who were died later, even to 1919. I believe those were would have been people who died in famous or that. And there was also a map of the dead places, and we can see that a lot of uh, people from Lapua indeed died in Tampere region. Then there would be a button to also download the data in CSV form. But let's go to look at the battles. Yes, so battles in similar way, there are a table view, and then we can look at them in a map. Uh, see the battles are concentrated here in the south of Finland. And there's this very nice animation that uh, we can, for example, for educational purposes, use to track the advance of the progress of the Civil War. And you can see how the sort of front is formed there in the middle of Finland, and sort of along the railway lines. And I'm sure this helps to uh, visualize the course of the war better. So, yeah, and you can all try this yourself. Thank you. And there was, uh, let's see, one question, I believe, in chat. Let's see. Yes, so I think the question was about about the feedback that was mentioned, I think, in the beginning. So, so feedback for the uh, data set of the war victims. So how was it collected and could you describe the quality of the feedback somehow? Feedback was collected by 
traditional mail and email and every possible way that people can send feedback here. Uh, mostly the feedback was quite good quality, but we checked everything from the archival sources before we updated anything to the database. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I can ask a uh, short question also. So, uh, what kind of uh, data modeling work was involved? I mean, uh, were there any challenges? You mentioned hey, that there's so many information about these records. So, so how difficult was it to to create a linked data version of this? And and uh, how general is the data model? I'm, or versus how specific it is for this actual this individual data? Yeah, so it's uh, the data model there is very, very specific. So it's uh, very specific and it mainly copies the original data model for a large part that wasn't the original with, with some changes uh, in the original data. So in a way, so if you would like to do this more general data model using CDOX or something, I think you could do sort of uh, sort of dumb it down a little bit so and have only the main main data about that and I'm sure that if there would be resources that would be good ideas to do or it would be difficult because there is simply so many different so very specific semantics so there's like semantics for first place of capture the second place of capture and even the third place of capture and this this is probably not how I would have myself done 20 years ago the database however it's it would feel bad to sort of dump the semantics down so in a way i want to keep all the detail in the semantics and not loosen yeah this area when i'm speaking one interesting aspect of this project was also that we got conflicting information from different sources and in this system we actually represent the different even conflicting pieces of information uh, as kind of annotations of the data. Yes, there are some, of course, you can see in some uh, some data there are conflicting information indeed. We try to keep sort of, we try to choose in that case for certain important data, not, not all, all pieces of data, but the most important ones do have this sort of official and this is we think we think this is the correct 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 data but uh, even then there is the, the other other pieces of data are as shown and with the sources so yes okay and, and even then people i believe there will still get feedback that people think that something is wrong and all the time so. yeah that's that's often the case. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Heikki and Ilkka, for your presentation. And now we can move on to history sample, a Finnish time machine. And Heikki Rantala will, will continue presenting it. Oh, it's me again. Let's see. see if I have the other presentation available. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I hope you now can see the uh, history sample slides. So history sample is uh, an ongoing project. Uh, Still very much in a, in a way in the beginning, but also the project has that has been going on for a long time, maybe ten years already, or something like that. Hopefully, we can uh, make something out of it. Very nice. So I will be first talking about the background of the histology and this history sample project, and then the reasons why why to do it. And then have some talk about the vision for the future. Great and wonderful history sample. So the the data that we have for history sample, so basically this histology ontology originally comes from this uh, Agricola Suomen Humanistiverkko 
uh, which is uh, both mass researchers, uh, their historical, uh, their historical timeline that they had published. I believe it's not available anymore on their pages, but we we had the data up there and sort of continued from that. And it's, I think, even more than 10 years ago already. And however, it, uh, and it's been continued a little bit later, a few years ago by Esko Ikkala, and even then it's still a sort of a little bit unfinished. However, the reasons to do it, why, why, why would you like to have an ontology of historical events? Of course, uh, we want these unique identifiers. Uh, as we have seen, uh, it's difficult to know who, is, who was Roosevelt, who was, who was uh, there were even multiple Roosevelt's in the Second World War. Uh, and identifying between different events, there may be different names or different events. It's useful to have a single identifiers, unique identifiers to express what is exactly what we're talking about. Also, uh, having this semantic machine understandable descriptions of the events would be important. So, so the Finnish Civil War, having the computer to understand, to know immediately that this, this it started from that date and ended and on that day, and perhaps these people participated in and expressing that in a semantic machine readable way will, will be very useful in a research use. And also, uh, of course, what this allows having these identifiers publicly allows linking uh, different materials. So many, many different materials may be talking about the same thing. They may be mentioning uh, Phoenix Civil War, but then uh, having this uh, central ontology where you can all link and then know that we are talking about the same thing makes every, uh, communication much easier. So, historical events have many properties. They are linked in many ways. They are linked to people and organizations. They are linked to usually historical places, actually, which it may be a little bit more difficult than just any place. And, and maps, they are linked to these times and periods like uh, Middle Ages. And they are linked to, of course, museums who describe their um, objects, for example. Telling to other historical events, they can be, for example, part of the bigger event like Battle of Tampa is part of the Finnish Civil War. And of course, there are linked to this biographical data like in the biography sample. And our goal is to express all of these relations semantically again machine readable way and, and to link it to link these uh, events to international and domestic materials. So what we have currently in the historiantology, there is over 1000 usually probably important events of Finnish history and we already have some semantic uh, description of those events and different language times places, people, and the, the different types and relates to other events. However, while the initial version does exist, we do still need a lot more work and in and cooperation with researchers of history. Here you can see typical example of in a in a Finto, uh, Koto ontology or describing Holland uh, crisis, Ahvenanmaa crisis. And you can see there, there does exist a word for this. However, very little is said about it. It's, it's really just names in few different names for it. Uh, it has some upper term and it, it does have an identifier, but that's it really. And this is, this is, of course, what is usual for this Koko ontology and things in Finta. 
they tend to be very simple, but at least they do give the name. However, in histo, uh, presenting the same event as all and crisis, you can see that there are many different sort of types there. It is uh, international crisis, it's, it is part of team political history, and these are all entities, they are not just literal descriptions. There are many, many participants, again, linking to these URIs. There, there is there are time, there are expressed places where it happens, and it's related to other events and so on. And these can be used to automatically deduce things in a way that's simply this uh, Finto description could. However, as uh, Sampo, perhaps I'm not sure how exactly we have talked about this, but with, with Sampo we do mean many things. We do mean to say data service and applications on top of that data service. So here we would plan to do basically three, three different things. There's the data service for the Histo ontology, and that would be an LDF platform, and that would be used by the software developers, and it would have this very specific semantic information. Then would hopefully would do also sort of simplified SCOS version of simple vocabulary of, of the events and publish that in Onkin Finto platform, and that would be used by catalogers and so on, and that would be just, just, just the names and simple relations. And then we would have this history sample portal would, that would be the web application created with sample we use by the uh, general public and researchers, and students, so on. Now, of course, uh, the ma main idea of what, what we see, hopefully we will have the great history sample one day. It would show uh, data from the histology mainly, but also from other other sources, uh, perhaps even like uh, second sources like, for example, and so on. And we use use that to visualize the things different way. But we already have a, a simple demo. Hopefully, can work it. Could we work on it and get get it better? And perhaps one day it will be this great sample sample to sample for samples to have to see when you see that there's a second world world that would perhaps take data from the for sample. Visualize it. Like you see here, all the samples do, or many of the samples of Finnish history, they are in a way related. So in the down here, we would have events that might be in this uh, is the ontology, like Finnish Civil War and Winter War. And in the Pistonos, there is defined that the Mannerheim participated in both Finnish Civil War and Winter War. And the Winter War and Finnish Civil War, they do have their own identity first and many other things. And of course, this Finnish Civil War event can be related to data in the war victim sample. Every, basically everything here, or many things here actually, are related to the Finnish Civil War, and we can get data from there. And of course, uh, in similar way, Winter War, we can get data from Winter War to War sample and perhaps a display in, in history sample. And of course, Mannerheim does exist, he does have a page in War sample, but also in Biography sample. All the important people of Finnish history are presented here. So things, and perhaps we can download data from there as well. So maybe, maybe we can combine, combine these things. After all, the data data tends to be in the, in the open, open Sparkle endpoints and can be used by any application. And here is the uh, front page of the current of the uh, history sample. And you can see that there would be perhaps multiple perspectives, there would be the events, but also people, places, periods, times, and so on. But, but we can come up. Okay, so thank you. So would there be any questions?
perhaps. Thank you, Heikki. I think we don't have any questions in chat yes, yet. Sir. So I can ask one question that came to my mind. So it's a bit related to uh, the issues we were discussing at, at uh, in the uh, war victim sample. So about the conflicting views on data. And I think for, for this kind of history ontology where we are trying to build a shared understanding of the world and, and describing the events in kind of a general way. So, so uh, what if there are some kind of conflicting views, like let's say events, uh, the dates, the topics. So what was this event actually all about, uh, for example, and uh, the event type also might be some other researchers might classify the events differently. So is there, have you thought about how to support this kind of kind of uh, conflicting or, or uh, different perspectives on this kind of events? And, and how do you see that people will uh, be able to commit to this kind of shared view? Yeah, this is of course a good question, very central. So how the data is done now in history and generally, it's uh, in, a, in a sort of a certain word, there is implicit perhaps that this, this is this certain database that says it, but no, no more specific. So of course, there is no, no reason why we couldn't say that uh, this, this piece of information is said by someone and this is sung by someone. And of course, perhaps we will do have, have some canonical view that we think this is it. like, for example, like when the Middle Ages end, I believe in some Marxist circles, they thought that the Middle Ages ended in the French Revolution. So, so some people might think that, but perhaps we, that is not the canonical we, we want to show, but that is still an interesting view. Uh, yes, uh, I think that's definitely an interesting thing. I think the main, main issue is that sort of that requires this uh, manual work, some degree, and like historian, some historian would need to sit down and sort of manually do those things. So it's, it's, uh, it would, that is something that we usually couldn't just magically come up with the computer. Of course, if it's some database says, says something and there, there's some database that says something else, yeah, in that case, we can easily differentiate between those. Yeah, this is Eero Hyvinen speaking. May I also uh, comment that, that, for example, uh, the Winter War, the Russians still say that the Finns started it and it's sort of considered yeah. as, as, as uh, implausible. But in, in any way, we can, we can represent this kind of information as, as kind of annotations that, that represent the winter war. And then, then this kind of uh, annotations that some people think that it, it happened in a different way by using the linked data and metadata representation. So I think linked data is a very good approach for this kind of, uh, for recording this kind of historical information and opinions about different historical events. So that's the good news. Uh, and the bad news is that it's difficult, of course. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, like Mikko Nikanen has commented that uh, events are often much uh, difficult to formalize some people and places. Uh, I'm actually not so sure. Like places are surprisingly difficult, actually. <laughs> so when, when you really start to start to think, think it, like what, what, is, what is even the concept of place? Uh, in, in, in some ways, uh, uh, events can be even easier. And there's a sort of limited number of the, of the events that, that does make it simpler. For, with, with people, there's simply so many, many people that, that, that there's, there would be a lot, lot of work. But there, if you uh, limit it to like important events, then maybe you can do manual work because there's maybe only 1,000 or something. Okay, thank you, Heikki. Thank you. So it's time to move on to the last, last, uh, last presentation of this session. So it's Academy Sampo, Finnish academic people, 1640 to 1899, and Petri Leskinen will present it. Yes, hello everyone. I'm Petri Leskinen. I'm a doctoral candidate at. Alta University, and I will be representing Academy Sample Project. 
Okay, first I will make a short introduction to the source data that is used in the project. The, most of this representation will be playing a project video. I will shortly introduce some new aspect of the semantic portal. And finally, there's time for your questions. So the source data, this is based on the Ulioplas matricelit, which are available as a website of Helsinki University. It contains detailed information about 28,000 historical university students. It had have been collected from various historical records like the records of university and also added with some parish records for the personal information. And there has been 10 years of manual work with, which was done by Yrjö Kotivuori and Vali, Veli Matti Autio. Okay, this is a video I've made for representing this project. So we will now switch to that one. Okay, I hope you all can see the video now. I will introduce the Academy SOMPA project. It is a project conducted in the Semantic Computing Research Group at Aalto University in Finland. This representation consists of three parts. First one will be a general introduction to the project. Then I will talk about the source data and how it was converted into linked open data and introduce the resulting data set. Finally, I will represent some results of data analysis performed with the data. The Academy SOMPA project is an ongoing project started in the year 2019. The project aims at converting and publishing the material of Finnish student register as linked open data. The project is a part of SOMPA series of portals and a continuation to our projects of historical people ontologies, such as War Sompa, Norset High School Register, and Biography Sompa. The Finnish Student Register contains information about students of University of Helsinki, which originally was founded as the Royal Academy of Turku, because for a long time it was the only university in Finland, we may say that the data contains most of the people with academic education in Finland between the years 1640 and 1899. Conversion and Dataset In the source data each person has a semi-structured text description. The fields from that source data have been extracted using regular expressions. We have also utilized vocabularies of person names and occupations, and taken advantage of the possible, existing HTML formatting. The text description includes basic biographical information, like a person's name, his or her places and times of birth and death, and the occupation. In addition to that, the description contains academic events such as enrollment, being a member in a student nation, completing a thesis, and graduation. Furthermore, the description also contains information about a person's later career and related career events like employment. The description also mentions related people. When available, there is a list of a person's parents, spouses, and also other relatives who have studied at the University of Helsinki. Also the professor's or instructor's name is usually referred with the academic events. In total, the person ontology contains 28,000 students and 54,000 relatives mentioned in the descriptions. Machine learning methods were used to disambiguate the relatives mentioned in different descriptions. Our aim was to interlink the person references from the earlier data set to the later one. In total, there are 120,000 family relations connecting the students and their relatives, and 4,000 other relations, for example connecting a student with a teacher. The biographical data is enriched with 170,000 events, like births and deaths with events related to a person's career. In addition to people and event data, the entire data set uses domain ontologies of for example places, occupations, family relations, and student nations. The place ontology with 2,600 resources is custom made for this project. 
The ontology includes historical place names from for example Karelia, Baltic countries, and Central Europe. The data has many references to small villages located in Sweden, which were extracted from GeoNames data service. The ontology of occupations contains more than 10,000 descriptions. One such a description contains often a place names connected with an occupation, for example Bishop of Porvor, or Bishop of Turku. The occupations are linked to Ammo, Finnish ontology of historical occupations, which is a Finnish extension of HISCO, Historical International Standard Classification of Occupations. The ontology of family relations contains not only the close relatives, like parents, children, and spouses, but also more distant relations, like in-law relatives or relations reaching over several generations. The data publication contains also some smaller, domain-specific ontologies for representing for example student nations, categories, and organizations. The category data was included in the source data. The student nations and organizations were both extracted from the text descriptions. For representing the biographical information, an actor event-based schema is used. The schema is based on the CIDUC CRM standard. In addition to CIDUC CRM, BioCRM is used for representing person roles and interpersonal relations. BioCRM has been developed and used in our earlier projects on Norsi High School Register and Biography Sompa. In the actor event schema a person resource is enriched with events, which facilitates dealing with a possibly varying amount of data available for an individual person. The people in the register are represented as instances of the person class, and the mentioned relatives using the referenced person class. In the semantic representation, the resources of actor classes are enriched with lifetime events and relationships. Events, for example birth, death, or enrollment, are subclasses of the event class. Furthermore, the events are enriched by linkage to corresponding places, times, or occupations. Data Analysis This is a statistics view in the Academy Sompa user interface. By looking at the amount of people enrolled, it can be observed that before the 1870s, the number of enrollments remained at a relatively constant level. However, after that, this number starts increasing fast towards the end of the century. This is another timeline visualization, and it shows the number of students alive at each particular year. The number decreased in the early 18th century, during the time of the Great Northern War, and a plague epidemic. There are also some decreases in the late 18th and early 19th century, during the Russo-Swedish War, and the Finnish War, after which Finland became an autonomous part of the Russian Empire. Finally, during the late half of the 19th century, there is a growth from slightly less than 4,000 into more than 8,000 students. This slide depicts the five most common occupational categories on a timeline. The curve on the top shows the total number of people in each category, while the bottom curve depicts the percentage. From the bottom image it can be seen that during the three centuries the proportion of religious occupations has decreased from 75 to mere 10%, respectively. The fields of public administration and education have had an increasing growth during the 19th century. In the universities in Sweden and Finland, the student nations were named after historical regions, and the students had to join the student nation corresponding to their own geographical place of origin. This map visualization shows how the place of birth correlates with the student nation. The maps clearly shows how students of for example Tavastia, or Småland nations concentrate on the corresponding regions. The data set is rich with the family relations. As a chosen example of the family networks, we have picked a family line starting from Josef Valianius. 64 of his descendants have also been students at the university during the following seven generations. In addition to the family relations, the data set contains a network of teacher-student relations, spanning all the way from the 1640s to late 1800s. By network centrality measures, like page rank, the most central person in this network is Henrik Gabriel Porthan, who has been the instructor or supervisor for more than 170 academic theses. 
He was a professor and rector at the Royal Academy of Turku, and a scholar sometimes titled as the father of Finnish history. The two other central figures are the university professor and bishop of Turku, Jakob Gardolin, and professor and historian Algorth Skerin. I will now thank you all for listening. More information about the project is available at the web page of the Semantic Computing Research Group. Okay, thank you. I will now go, go on with the slides. Okay, hope you liked the video. Now uh, view a few aspects of the semantic portal. This is the main entry page and currently there are two main perspectives, one for the people and the other one for places. On the people view, you can browse the data of 28,000 students, you can filter the results based on the times of birth and death and enrollment or the related occupations or organizations or student nations. The data is also linked to other databases like Biography Sample, of course the original Yliopilas Matrikkeli pages and Wikidata. The Im person images shown here come from Wikidata. This is the place view in case of our places, they are not only towns or villages or countries or counties, but also some significant public buildings, like for instance, in this view, we can see the Academy House and the castle in Turku. And the places can be filtered by their name or by the hierarchy so that we can search for all places, like for instance, in Tavastia region. There are also several instance pages for looking at the titles, student nations, different categories. Categories are like high schools or foreign universities or religion or military organizations, etc. And the organizations are parishes and companies, etc. The example screenshot shows the title of Turun Piispa, the Bishop of Turku. In this case, we have a list of all the people, there are more than eight, but it only shows eight who have had the title Bishop of Turku. Here's the related place, the related entry at the Amma ontology and related titles like Bishop of Porvo or Bishop of Tallinn. Uh, that's all. Th I thank you for listening. Now it's the time for questions. Okay, thank you, Petri. So I can ask you one, well, it's quite detailed question, but uh, you mentioned uh, bishop of bishop of Porvo and Turku. So, so these are the occupations, or, or the occupations are modeled as such. So, so what about bishop in general? Is there some kind of semantic relation? That yes, there is the Ammo ontology mentioning also the bishop. From the source data, we had this. Uh, I'm somehow losing, am I losing the connection or are you, Joni, losing your connection? Anyway, anyway, I will, can you hear me now? I think okay. you can hear it, yes. Okay, thank you. Anyway, in the occupations mentioned in the, mentioned in the source, source 
texts are such that it can be like Bishop of Turku or Bishop, Bishop of Vipuri or just simply Bishop. Of course, we have linked these to, to the Amma ontology, where which only has the one the, the head title of sim, simply Bishop. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Eero Hemmelö speaking. Uh, yes. one, one thing that we are actually looking now in this project is, is uh, historians who would be interested in using this data for, for data analysis. So, so if there are people interested in, in, in studying Finnish history from, from this kind of academy point of view, please contact us. The data is now there and it's ready, ready to be used. And, uh, and uh, I think that uh, there are lots of interesting questions that could be approached by using this data. It, it's, it's quite unique data and, and lots of effort has been put there as, as Petri mentioned, 10 years of, of manual work by these two guys who, who really, really literated the data from, from, uh, from handwritten manuals and so on. Yes. Okay, I was having some connection issues, but I'm back. Yes. Good. So, Okay, so I guess it's time to thank Petri. And uh, now we are a bit behind the schedule. So I would suggest that we keep a very short coffee break and we'll continue with the show at 15.45. So 15 past four. And then we'll continue with, with forging the samples part two. Okay, welcome back to the final session of the five more samples. I'm, I'm Eero Hyvönen and I will be chairing this, this final session. Without further ado, I give the floor to Mikko Koho at Heldigan Aalto and Ville Rohjel at the Finnish Heritage Agency on Find Sampo, Archaeological Finds of Metal Detectorists. Okay, thank you, Eero. So I hope you can all see my slide now. Yes. So I'm Mikko from University of Helsinki and Aalto University and with Villa Rohiola from the Finnish Heritage Agency. We are presenting uh, Find Sampo Finnish archaeological finds as linked to open data. And first, Villa will uh, present uh, a bit about the metal detecting in Finland and the background of find sample. And I will continue then with the uh, find sample linked data knowledge base and the find sample reporter and find sample portal. Yes, thank you, Mikko, and thank you, Eero, and good afternoon. So I'm Villa Rohjala from the Archaeological Collections of the Finnish Heritage Agency, also called nowadays FHA, Museo Virasto in Finnish. So I have been working with Eero and his brilliant team since 2017. And during the last three years, we've worked to add archaeological finds to be part of the semantic web. So as Mikko said, my agenda here is to give first you a short introduction to the metal detecting in Finland. The idea is to give you some background before introducing uh, you the project, the project called SUALT and the development work done with Find Sampo. In the end of my part, I will briefly talk about the possibilities of citizen science. So recreational metal detecting started in Finland already in the 1980s but it took over 30 years for it to become a popular activity among the general public. At the beginning of 2010s, the number of metal detectorists increased considerably, as did the number of finds. With the popularity of the hobby, the number of finds made by the public grew tenfold 
so 10 times more than it was before. Since the beginning of the 2010s, the number of delivered fines has varied annually from 2,000 to 3,000. Before that, it was a couple of hundreds per year. In Finland, metal detecting is generally permitted, but the detectors have to follow certain acts of law, such as the Antiquities Act of Finland. Metal detecting, especially digging, are strictly prohibited at the ancient monuments and other archaeological sites by the Antiquities Act. The Act also requires that discovered objects, such as metal detecting finds, that are expected to be at least 100 years old and do not have any known owner, have to be reported and delivered without delay to the Finnish Heritage Agency. In other words, to the archaeological collections of the agency. In early 2019, the FHA launched Ilpari, a new digital reporting service. The new service streamlined the reporting of the archaeological finds by the public, and the first steps towards web-based citizen science were taken. Even though the reporting became more effective and user-friendly, the new reporting system was primarily designed to support administrative processes in the management of fines. The service, however, does not give access to the fine data for broader public dissemination. So there was a need to develop a platform to disseminate, share the fine data and archaeological information. The SWALT project was initiated in 2017 as a response to the before mentioned necessity. The name of the project SWALT translates from Finnish to English as the Finnish Archaeological Finds Recording Linked Open Database. The partners in the project are the University of Helsinki, Aalto University and the Finnish Heritage Agency. The four-year consortium is funded by the Academy of Finland. This project cooperates with similar international projects that have developed open databases for finds in different European countries or federal regions, such as Portable Antiquity Scheme from England and Wales, PAN from Netherlands, Media from Flanders, Belgium, and DIME, DIME from Denmark. As a multidisciplinary research project, SWOT develops innovative solutions for reporting, collecting, and managing archaeological finds, applying citizen science and semantic computing. The goal of the project is to develop and produce a prototype of a linked open data service and semantic web portal called FindSampo. The project aims to support the FHA with an updated research infrastructure which provides the public a new open access service to study and learn, more, and learn more about the archaeological finds. It aims to improve cooperation between the public, researchers and heritage management. <clears throat> the platform will also function as an educational tool for the public to learn more about archaeology and find guides and instructions to, to obey the law. In the end of the project, in August 2021, the fine sample platform will be launched and given to the Finnish Heritage Agency. In my last slide, I, I'm emphasizing the key word in our project, that is citizen science. Citizen science refers to activity in which amateurs and non-professionals voluntarily assist by observing, analyzing or collecting large datasets for scientists in cooperation with scientific research. SWALT project applies citizen science that emphasizes cooperation with different users. We aim at engaging end users to have impact on it from the very beginning. The project applies a user-centered design approach where the needs and requirements of end users have been investigated with user experience research. The research has included questionnaires, interviews, focus group meetings and field testing. Through the citizen science approach, the project aims to a genuine partnership between different users, reflecting here to the idea of shared cultural heritage, where the past is not only owned by the professionals, but also belongs to everyone. Thank you. Mikko continues from here.
Okay, thanks. So, yes, I will again go back to this sort of initial situation when the project started, when the, when Ilpari didn't exist yet. So, so the FHA would uh, retrieve handwritten find information or emails about find information and and then sort of manually put them to the database. And then uh, this was the sort of vision to, to then improve on this. So there would be this linked data knowledge base and uh, reporting basic find information would be done directly from the field. And you intelligent user interfaces would support this uh, by using the linked data knowledge base. And also the, the knowledge base would be built uh, all the time from the reported finds. And uh, then the idea is also to, to communicate with uh, other European finds databases. Yeah, so, so the find sample link, link data, basically the, the seed data that was shown there is uh, thousands of finds from the Finnish Heritage Agency database. Uh, there's an ontology infrastructure created to support this as linked data. And the ontology for museum domain is used as the basis. And these finds are uh, manually mapped to, to this MAO ontology by domain experts, while also linking to, to Getty uh, art and architecture thesaurus to, to provide an international uh, interoperability. And also this MAO is uh, enriched with archaeological terms in this process. And, and we, we are uh, aiming to, to provide uh, links mainly through this Getty AAT to other international finds databases. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about historical time periods, which are important concepts in archaeology. Uh, so the time periods are, are not exact. They are based on different interpretations, uh, which brings this fuzziness into the concept. So for example, middle age in, in Finland can start at different time based on, uh, on different interpretations. Uh, and for this project, uh, there was a work in doing, uh, doing this ontology infrastructure and part of this was this uh, uh, time periods in Finland. which also support this, this kind of fuzziness. And uh, Periodo is used as a linked open data standard for defining the time periods in an interoperable way. So then the find sample reporter is a prototype created for, uh, for reporting the finds directly from the field with, with a mobile phone or, or any other uh, uh, device. So it, it was developed to, to realize the reporting part of the, the vision. Um, yeah, so the interoperability between the, the reporter and existing FHA systems wa was found out actually to be quite challenging and there is still further development needed to, to take this into use. So there is also a prototype of the findsable portal for studying the existing finds, having a, yet again a faceted search interface and a different views of the results empowered by the sample UI. Uh, so here is a selection made of, uh, based on the ma material facet to show all silver object finds, which are 427. Shown here is the table view with also a photograph of the object. There are also map, heat map and timeline view for analyzing the results. 
So the map view shows here the silver object points on the map. And you can see that there is uh, this cluster of 147 points and uh, other smaller clusters in this. So well, yes, this kind of a novel timeline visualization was developed to the find sub portal, which shows the distribution of the filtered finds over time. So finds are grouped by material type, which provides the user with a new kind of perspective on the material distribution of finds in time. Uh, the find landing pane page shows the find information and will show links to similar finds in the find sample knowledge base, but also links to similar finds in other European finds databases. Uh, there is uh, data to show cultural heritage areas on a map together with archaeological finds to support the users and also so forbidden areas where digging is not allowed. Uh, then in addition to these user interfaces, there is an open SparkQL endpoint for the data where all the finds data and ontologies are available for, it, for anyone. Uh, here is an analysis and visualization of co-occurring Iron Age object types found in the same municipality. For example, if coins, uh, or which is money in this, are found, then the probability for jewelry is 93%, uh, but finding jewelry indicates coins with less probability, 41%. And probability for co-occurrence of weapon and coin finds is very low. So this kind of uh, data analysis uh, can be done. This is, for example, done with uh, with uh, Google Colab that Eero also mentioned earlier. And thank you. There's a link to find more information. And if you have any questions, we can uh, answer those. Thank you. We have time for a question. Questions to Mikko or Ville? Okay, if there are no, no questions, uh, we perhaps can continue and, 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 and get the time schedule uh, back, so to say. So thanks for the presentation, Mikko and Ville. And, and now the next uh, presentation is about law sample, Finnish legislation and case law on the semantic web, a very, very different kind of application domain for the sample technology. Minna Tamper uh, from Heldik and Aalto will present together with Aki Hietanen from Ministry of Justice. Yes, hello, I'm Minna Tamper. And is Aki also there? Cannot hear Aki. Okay, perhaps there are some technical problems or, or, or uh, Aki is, should be there, but it's muted, Aki. You, you, are, you should uh, push the unmute button. This is Aki here from Finnish Ministry of Justice. Yes, now we can hear you, okay. 
Okay, so maybe I will start and I will give the mic for, to Aki in a bit. So we're here to talk about the Law Sampo portal that we are creating and the contents of our presentation. First, we are going to talk a bit about Law Sampo, the new approach to legal information search. Then we have a bit about Law Sampo portal and its views. Then <coughs> working progress and more information about the project and finally questions. And now I will toss the mic to Aki. Okay, thank you, Minna. I hope everybody hears my voice as well. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here presenting the, the Law Sampo, the latest member of the Sampo family. And uh, in Finland, the Ministry of Justice has been cooperating with Alta University and Heldic for a number of years, I think since 2012. First in the, in the Linked Data Finland project and then in the Semantic Finlex project. And this uh, new Sampo, Law Sampo, is uh, a sub-project in the latest joint project of, of the Ministry of Justice and Heldic and Alta University. Uh, the project is called ANOPI and it deals with the anonymization and annotation of uh, documents containing personal data. And uh, for this project funding has been provided by the Finnish Ministry of Finance. Uh, for the law sample, if we turn to the next page, I think we can easily say that it's uh, okay. Next page. Oh, can you see the? No, I, I'm still on the first page. Okay, I will try again. To share the presentation. Yeah, okay. But uh, concerning the the content of the law sample, it's a totally new kind of way of uh, analyzing and um, so to do so-called data mining in the in the legal materials. The law sample is, is uh, utilizing the data of the semantic Finlex, including legislation from, from the Finnish, Finnish materials and, and then also the case law of the Supreme Courts of Finland. And, and for law sample, I think there are a number of new kind of approaches to the search on, on the legal materials. Firstly, concerning citizens, there is a new kind of possibility to, to find materials related to certain life events, like uh, birth of, of a child, uh, going to education, going to university, getting married, uh, and so on. And, and finally, getting retired and, and going to pension and so on. So for citizens, this law sample provides a new tool for finding information on a certain life event with the help of keywords and uh, smart searches on the law materials and, and on the court materials as well. And thereby law sample is, is something which is helpful not only to citizens, but also for lawyers, there is a new kind of faceted search on legislation, which uh, provides new dimensions to legal materials. For example, the, the connection to EU level legislation and so on. And then for judges, there's a new kind of element which uh, finds sim similarities between a certain sample text and, and then the massive uh, case law databases uh, and thereby it's really a it will be when it's finalized it will be a new kind of tool 
for finding legal information. And, and we are happy that we have been involved in this project. And at the same time, we are, we are developing further the Finlex services and hopefully some law sample will be integrated in, in the national Finlex as well. But now it's time to continue. So, Aki, can you see my next slide or? Yes, we can see those slides. Okay, good. So, this is our team of who are working in the Law Sample project currently. And we have people from the Ministry of Justice, such as Aki, and from Edita Publishing LTD, and from Aalto University and Heldig. Next, I'm going to talk briefly about the law sample portal and show you a bit what it is about. So here is our first demo of the law sample portal and here we have the first image of the portal where we have first three facets or search views where we can search with the search for statutes, case law and then we have an, a third application case law finder. So if we look at the statute search, we will have a faceted search application similar to the ones that have been shown before in this session, um, where you can search for statutes based on document type, statute type, statute year, and EU directive currently. And in the center, you will get a list of statutes based on where you can see their name, their type, year, and if they're related to some EU directive. And you can also read the original versions or different versions of the directives or the statutes from here. Then we have a case law search where we have a similar view as in the statute search, but for case laws in the facets, we will have, uh, we have the tab where you can select the court. We have the Supreme Court and the another one there available currently. Then we have judges and we have keywords and below there should be also timestamps as well that you can search based on timestamps. And in center you will have the view of the case law, case, case laws listed by the label and then there's the abstract that you can expand also to see it completely there. And then you have the court, judge, keywords, judgment date, and a possibility to read the court decision, the case law document, by clicking the button. The third search application that we have is the semantic case law finder, which is, a, it is an application where you can put in a text and it will, it will try to find similar case law documents. You can add there a case law, a court decision or you can freely describe what you want to find for example if you want to find some specific kind of a case or if you have yourself you are in a legal trouble or going to the court and you have a specific kind of a case you can try to find similar kinds of cases with this search and this one uses uh, and ensemble algorithms to ensemble of algorithms to find the similar kinds of cases that are textually similar the one to the text that the people will add there into the document content field and then they will submit and it will show a list of similar court cases sorted based on a similarity score on the right hand side. Then we have a fourth interface coming soon which is an exploratory search engine. Um, it's an application that helps users to find and explore relevant laws for their life events. There are different ways to search, freeform search, keyword search, and then you can use categories. Uh, the search result will automatically adapt to the user's choices. So in here you can, for example, search for if you have a specific life event, let's say retirement or 
birth of a child or something like that and you can search for legislation that's related to these cases then what is going on right now that we are doing in addition to this well we have we are planning to transform legal text that we have the statutes and the case law as linked data then we are planning to annotate them with named entities and subject indexing using the tools presented in an earlier presentation. Um, then we have we are planning to do some data analytics to see what sort of statistics and visualizations we can do with the data and also if we can do some network analytic applications to visualize them. For example, to see what court decisions are referenced in different court decisions or how different parts of a statute are referenced in a court decision, for example. And then, as mentioned, the live situation search gets an user interface so that users can use it as a part of the law sample portal. For more information on the project, this is still an ongoing project. There's the website for the project and then some publications already. Thank you, and if you have any questions, please ask them now. Yeah, time for one or two questions. Uh, in the chat there is nothing, but, but if you have a question, you can, you can also use the voice. Yeah, this is ongoing, ongoing work and, and um, it's, it's interesting. It's based on, on uh, earlier things that we have done with the Ministry of Justice on, on publishing, linked, uh, publishing legislation and case law as linked data, as Aki Hietanen told there. And, and, and it's interesting to see what, what will come out from this, this project. But I, I think it will be something different from, from what the situation is today. So we are trying to make the legislation uh, understandable, not only to the machine, but, but to the people who need it. And that's of course a very, very tough thing to do because legislation is far from trivial to understand. But let's move on, on to the next presentation that's actually related to Law Sampo in the sense that the legislation that we are publishing in Law Sampo are made in a parliament of Finland and, and we also have another other Sampo project going on uh, called Parliament Sampo, Finnish Parliament on the Semantic Web and it will be presented by Jouni Tuominen from Heldik and Aalto and Päivikki Karhula from Parliament of Finland. Okay, thank you Aaron. I hope you can see my slides now. So, the topic yeah. of the talk is Parliament Sampo, uh, Finnish Parliament on the Semantic Web. No slides yet, Joni. Okay. Let's try again. What can you see? You can see something, I guess. Let's try again. At the moment, it's you. Uh, What about now? Yes. Okay, good. But we cannot see the full screen if you tried that. No, I will. Yes, what about now? Yes. Good. Okay, good. Okay. So I'm Jouni Tuominen uh, from Heldik and Semantic uh, Computing Research Group, SECO. Uh, and uh, another presenter of this presentation is Päivikki Karhola from Library of Parliament. So, the presentation is outlined as such, so that Päivikki first talks about the open data services of the Parliament of Finland, and then I will continue about the Parliament Sampo vision and its current status. So, Päivikki, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm, um, my name is Päivikki Karhula, and I'm Chief Information Specialist for Network Services in the Library of Parliament. 
And also I have been a content related project manager for the development of open data service for the parliament. And in this session, I will shortly introduce the structure and development of our open data service. And firstly, in this figure, you can see the development path of the service. In 2010, we began with a pilot project in cooperation with Uvascular University. And we began with a study of potential user groups and the requirements concerning contents and functionalities of the open data service. Our service was further developed on this basis five years later. We continued the project by developing requirements and information architecture for the service. At this point, we aim to store the data in, in Parliament information systems, but unfortunately this approach didn't succeed well and we needed to revise our plans and redefine architecture for the service. But in um, 2018, a cloud service based open data service was taken into use and this version was developed further by extending contents to the service. At present, we have four year development plan for the service until 2024 and our goals are to renew the technical architecture again, extend contents, enable real time access on data and improve the user interface and usability of data. So uh, our open data service includes old and present uh, parliamentary documents voting data and data on MPs absence from parliamentary sessions and committee meetings and data on members of parliament and their seating map. There are six different sections in the service which open up slightly different views on data. <coughs> Firstly, there are three different search options on data structures, pretext type of search, data set based on search, based search to parliamentary documents and database search. All these search options rather open up views on data structures to support formulating queries to REST interface. Technical search also open up, op opens up views on structures and databases, tables and fields on the data. Uh, in addition, there are three other sections on a service which have um, more user-friendly options to search and load data. All digitized parliamentary records between uh, 1907 to uh, year 2000 are on a separate section which has specific search and load options. Also data on members of the parliament and their photographs are on a separate section and again there are specific search options and possibility to load data. And finally, there is a separate section for resolutions, which at this point reflects our pilot approach to search and load open data by allowing loading of research results in JSON, Excel and CSV format. And our aim is to apply this approach in the future to other data types, uh, other data types as well. Uh, basically, we are happy about providing major part of our public contents as open data, but there are still needs to develop more user-friendly approach to load data. And we have recognized four main user groups for open data. Citizens who typically want up-to-date information on current topics in an easy-to-read format. Experts who have more specific needs and may want to utilize larger data sets. They typically know well the documents and what they are searching for. Data analysts and coders who are proficient in coding and using APIs may also want to utilize automatic data export functions. And finally, members of the parliament and parliament staff are our specific user groups. They typically require up-to-date and accurate information for information service, planning and decision making, Decision makers also value analyzed data in an easy to read format as a basis for decision making. Our future plans for open data service include an architectural change again, which is bound to broader renewal project of the parliament internet services. According to the preliminary plan, public data from the parliament databases would be gathered 
on the data hub on a cloud and public network services of the parliament will be built on that basis uh, through APIs, including open data interface. You will find our present version of open data service on an address avointata.eduskunta.fi. Also, there is a section of open data service avoin data on the main page of the Parliament website. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Pai Vicky. So I will now continue from the Parliament sample vision and current status. Uh, so the overarching uh, vision of uh, Parliament sample portal or portal and data data service is to provide the parliamentary discussions and te texts and networks based on these discussions and texts as linked open data. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, we will build on the great work that the Parliament of Finland has done uh, and the library has done on this uh, open data service, but we will kind of uh, further develop the data in a way that it's uh, hopefully even more in, in a more user friendly format for, for application developers, researchers and other parties to use or also uh, for the public to use through Sambo portal. Uh, so the work work on uh, Parliament Sampo started in the beginning of this year, and it lasts uh, for I think for three years. So actually, there's a mistake. It should be 22. So Sempal uh, Academy of Finland Digi Home Project, uh, and and it's a consorting project. So we have three partners. We have Heldig, uh, where the main focus is to develop the language analysis and technologies for processing these parliamentary discussions and texts. Then we have Aalto University, uh, SECO, the Semantic Computing Research Group at the Department of Computer Science, uh, where the main focus is building, building and developing the data services and data modeling and infrastructures for the data coming, coming from the uh, Parliament of Finland and then analyzed with these language analysis tools. And finally, the third partner is, is from University of Turku, the Center for Parliamentary Studies, where the main focus is, is the political and media studies. So that's the, the third partner is, is the actual digital humanities researcher. And the first two, two of the partners here are kind of building the infrastructure. So this is kind of a very nice example of a digital humanities project from from my perspective. So it 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 has all these different partners with different different uh, different kind of uh, uh, tasks or backgrounds. And then then in this multidisciplinary way of working, we we try to achieve something new and answer research questions that come from all of the fields. So language technology, computer science, and political and media studies as well. So the, here I have some example research questions from the digital humanities perspective. So mostly from the political studies or, or language analysis or history. history. So, so we are uh, quite interested in the language layer in this project. So, so we can for example, uh, study how the concept, so what kind of topics are actually discussed in, in the uh, plenary sessions of Parliament of Finland. So how, how the topics change in time, when they come up, how they, how they disappear and so on through time. Uh, then then we, can, we can form different kinds of networks based on, the, based on these discussions. So which, which kind of, or which uh, members of Parliament discussed with uh, other members. Uh, then, then we can dive deeper, well, not deeper, but on a different level, uh, consider the language. So not just 
and land and so on in political debates. And then finally, different kinds of other network analysis, not just based on the discourse, uh, the discussions, but also based on, let's say, the members of parliament being in the same government together, being in the same committees, or in some other positions of trust. And in this project, the special focus is, is uh, on the New Year data, so coming from the, or starting in the 90s, but in, we are still, uh, even though the uh, digital humanities research question focuses especially on those, we are still interested in the whole history of the data. So we are actually processing the whole data from the Open Data Service of Parliament from the 1907 year. So in here we have identified two core data sets in the Parliament Sampo. So firstly is the parliamentary debates at the plenary sessions. So Täys Istunto at Eduskunta, the Parliament of Finland. And not only the debates, uh, which are in the minutes of the plenary sessions, but also other kinds of documents that provide context for the discussions. So for example, as Parliament's most important task is to enact new laws or to change, modify the existing ones. Uh, the the uh, enactment process starts with a, typically with a government proposal. So government proposes a new law and then we have the uh, first discussion or the lähete keskustelu in the, in the Great Hall. And then the law proposal goes to committees and then it comes back to the plenary sessions multiple times. And then in, at the end, we, we will have a legislation in force. So we are very interested in this whole, whole chain or this chronology of how the law, law evolves, how it, how it uh, borns and so on. Another core data set is the members of the, uh, parliament. So as Päivikki uh, told, there is this uh, personal data that, that's available at the open data service. So, so for example, the birth years and so on the birth dates of the par parliament members, the parties in different times which they have been members of, the different committee memberships, position trust, positions of trust and so on and so on. And here once again we are interested in linking this member data to other data sets. For example in biography sample we have some biographies of, of members of parliament and so on. And also the absence and voting data might be interesting to link here. Uh, one of the kind of uh, previous works we have done is the US Congress dataset visualizations and, and sample like uh, user interface. So in collaboration with Koki Miyakita from Keio University who was visiting SECO research group, we created this uh, US Congress prosopographer where the end user can search for members of the US Congress based on the different facets, for example, the chamber, the political party, the representing state, and so on and so on. So the similar ideas will be applied in this parliament sum. So this is the kind of, uh, kind of a big picture of the data production and, uh, or the data production pipeline, which we have uh, started planning and implementing already. So on the left hand side you can see the different data sets coming from coming from the uh, Parliament of Finland. So for example the plenary sessions in different formats in different times as Päivikki thought and then also other supporting data like uh, at the University of Turku there is this Lakitutka, so law radar system which actually tries to tries to uh, visualize and represent the, the law enactment process. So we are very interested in, in linking our data to tears. So it's not, so then we don't have to reinvent the wheel, kind of. Uh, the basic idea here is that we take the data in, then we process it. For example, for PDF files, we are actually doing re-OCR for even higher quality than, than what was available at the Parliament of Finland. Then we convert these different formats in a shared
the different structured formats like, like linked data RDF or more traditional open data format XML, where this uh, CLARIN, the language network in Europe, has, has created this proposal for representing parliamentary debates, Parla CLARIN. So we are using, of course, the international uh, standards and not just invent everything from scratch. And then we are linking to other data sets like ontologies and, and a biography sample, which was already mentioned, and um, or occupations and so on. So, as I said, we have already re ocr the, the uh, whole PDF set from the plenary sessions from 1907 to 2000. Then the newer, newer ones, the HTML, HTML files from 2001 till 2014, and the newest ones, which come already as XML from 2015 till the present day. So we have created this pipeline which transforms them into the same harmonized format. And currently we, are, we have converted from year 1940 to present day. So there's a still bit, bit more work to cover the whole history. And that's because the, uh, the PDFs, their structure changes a bit. So, so you have to make these kind of modifications for the pipeline. So to take into account all the different formats. And the idea here is that we have the source data, for example, this PDF document as human readable one, then we convert it into structured data. And here we actually see an example of this Parla in XML format. So the different speakers have been identified here, Ben Zyskovic and ID of Ben Zyskovic and his speech content and then all these interruptions. So for example, the MP Tennilä uh, has this interruption välihuuto here, and it's, it's uh, identified from this text. And then after this, it's easier to process this data and make these sample kind of interfaces. And then we are, of course, uh, uh, creating this kind of uh, understanding on into which ontologies we should link this data and which ontologies could be used for automatically automatically identify the topics from the text. And as a starting point, of course, we are interested in this Library of Parliament subject headings, which we have received actually from Parliament and now we are converted in converting it into linked data. And then uh, in the end, it will be published as linked data at the Linked Data Finland service, where uh, citizens, researchers, application developers and others can, can have access to it, download it, make queries to it, build their own interfaces to it. And then, of course, data analysis can be built on top of it. For example, network analysis or correlation matrices uh, of how, how different parties are related to occupations, for example. And finally, the sample portal user interface, which we have uh, started planning already, but haven't yet implemented yet. yet. Uh, and one other portal, the law sample, which we just uh, heard a presentation, this will be kind of sister, sister portal to parliament sample because, because the laws are enacted in parliament. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Any questions? No questions, but uh, yeah. Perhaps we move on then, then because we are a little bit late in time. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, then we will have two final samples presented. Uh, these are international uh, initiatives. Uh, first, uh, the Mapping Medieval and Renaissance Manuscripts Migrations Project and MMM portal will be presented by Mikko Koho from Heldig and Aalto and Toby Burrows from University of Oxford. Thank you. Mm. Okay, so yes, hello again. I'm Mikko Koho from University of Helsinki and Aalto University and together with Toby Burrows from Oxford eResearch Center, we are presenting the mapping manuscript migrations. So the outline of the talk would be that first Toby uh, talks a bit about the Mapping Manuscript Migrations project. The data sources we used 
and uh, final project products. And then I will continue with how did we sort of get to those final products and, uh, and talk a bit uh, or look a bit at the mapping manuscript migrations portal. So you could Toby take it from here. Okay, thank you very much, Miko. Can we move to the next slide, please? Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Toby Burrows. I'm a researcher at the University of Oxford in the Oxford Research Centre. Um, and we're talking about the Mapping Manuscript Migrations Project. This project was funded for three years from July 2017 by the Digging Into Data Challenge, um, organised by something called the Transatlantic Platform. And the project focused on linking data sets relating to the history and provenance of medieval and Renaissance manuscripts. And by provenance, what we mean is the ownership history of those manuscripts over the many centuries um, after they were produced up to the present day. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, the project had four partners, Oxford University, Alto University, the Institut de Recherche et d'Histoire des Textes in Paris, and the University of Pennsylvania. Um, each partner was funded by their national research funding agency. Um, and these are the 24 people in total who worked on the project, and I'd like to acknowledge all their different contributions. Uh, you've got a mixture there of manuscript researchers, curators, librarians, and of course, uh, semantic web researchers. Okay, next slide. Um, and these are the main goals of the MMM project, starting with taking data from different sources and transforming them into a linked open data environment. Uh, we wanted to be able to browse and search the combined data and to visualize the data, especially from a geographical point of view. And we also wanted to explore various research questions against the data. And we made a commitment to make the data and the tools available for reuse. Okay, next slide, thank you. Now the project combined data from these three sources. So the Oxford catalog um, contains more than 10,000 manuscript descriptions of manuscripts in Oxford libraries and it uses documents encoded in TEI XML. Now the Schoenberg database is a relational database. It has more than 247,000 entries from sales catalogues and auction catalogues for manuscripts. And the Bibal database, also a relational database, has provenance information um, for more than 16,000 manuscripts. And all three sources have quite different data models and structures and interfaces, even though they all focus on the same thing, the history of medieval and Renaissance manuscripts. Okay, next slide, please. And here's a list of the various products of the project. Um, they include linked open data vocabularies, a public Sparkle endpoint, um, public semantic portal, which uses the Sampo UI software, um, a unified data model, tools for converting and transforming the data, a GitHub site with a Sparkle tutorial and other documentation, and a considerable number of presentations and publications. So I'll hand over to Miko now. Okay, thanks, Toby. Yeah, I could actually mention here that the Sampa UI is, is sort of um, also a product of this project as it was developed uh, initially for this. Okay, so yes, so then we were uh, starting with these three uh, very heterogeneous uh, databases about manuscripts. And uh, there was a a uh, daunting task of making them interoperable. But yeah, as the basis of this, we used, used linked data. So we have identities for objects instead of names. But it took uh, some, some time to understand the complexities of the source databases. But uh, for this 
uh, uh, harmonization, we, we created a data model that was able to represent the sort of various information that we get from, from the different sources, which is based on CDOC CRM and also this uh, Ferber standard. Um, and more specifically, this Ferber OO, which is like an object oriented uh, version ba based already on the CDOC CRM. So then, yeah, we, we were doing the task of sort of uh, reinterpreting the source data in terms of the harmonizing data model. And also entity reconciliation was in, important to sort of, uh, to, to understand the, what, what concepts are or what the entities are the same in, in different databases. Yeah, and one thing to note that is that um, the biggest data source database actually is a database about uh, sort of observations of manuscripts. So it didn't have this sort of concept of, of manuscript it, uh, itself. So the, that, that was one of the biggest sort of challenges in, in this. Uh, okay, so here is just to show an overview of then the, this harmonizing data model, which does have a lot of components, but in the end it's pretty much the simplest model to harmonize the data in a way that expresses the semantics of the source databases. So here in the sort of center, we have the, this manifestation singleton, which corresponds to the actual physical manuscript. And here we are making an assumption that uh, that all of the manuscripts are, are uh, sort of pr produced as a copies of, of some other manuscript. Because this is um, sort of information that is really not available whether they are copies or not. So we sort of to use this model, we have to make an assumption and, and this, this is then based on the, the knowledge that they, most of them are copies. And the intellectual content contained in the manuscripts is divided into two levels, which are work and expression. But I will not go into details of this, except to maybe say that, um, well, yeah, this intellectual content wasn't also, or, or isn't very well represented in the, in the databases. Uh, yeah, so then the, these transactions are, are a very key part of this as we are interested in the migrations of the manuscripts. So the manuscript provenance, who has owned and where the manuscripts have been at what time. And all of the databases actually do contain uh, this, this kind of information about these ownerships and movements. So yeah, yeah, so then we need to reconcile the entities in these databases to, to sort of merge the duplicate objects together somehow. Uh, so we have used automatic reconciliation as much as possible. For example, here we can see that they, they do share some identifiers, for example, places, the Getty names, uh, is, is um, getting place names, uh, TGN anyway, is, uh, is used quite a lot, except for Bibal, which, which used geo names in, instead, and we had to map those then to TGN. Uh, for persons and organizations, YF is, is very much used, so that, that was a good thing. Um, yeah. Uh, YF is virtual uh, international authority file. Yep. But then again, for the manuscripts, which are the sort of main thing, uh, there wasn't sort of anything that would at least combine information from all three. So for those, we had to devise uh, 
some something else which I will show in the next slide. But in addition then to, to automatic reconciliation, we have also done this sort of manual expert work in 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 uh, reconciling this or well, some of these entities uh, the, like the actors uh, meaning persons and organizations have been uh, quite well uh, harmonized or reconciled and there has been an attempt to, to manually harmonize works but there's just way, way too much of them and this also revealed then the these sort of issues um, that the semantics in the source databases regarding the intellectual work are, are, are different and, and in many cases a bit vague also. Um, yeah, so for manuscripts, we, we could use things like these uh, shelf mark identifiers shown here on the left, we see a manuscript in the Bodleian catalog. And then on the right, the same manuscript in, uh, in Bibal database. So we can see that they're, they share this, uh, some kind of a shelf mark, but, but then again, you, you might note that one, one is prefixed with a zero and the other one is not. So this also require a bit of work to actually use. And then Philips numbers are, are another uh, kind of identifier that we can use and sort of parse it from the manuscript uh, descriptions. So, we created this uh, repeatable data transformation pipeline using Docker Sparkle construct queries and custom Python components, which does the whole process of reinterpreting the source databases in terms of the harmonizing data model. And the end result of this is then the whole uh, MMM linked open data graph containing manuscripts, actors, places, intellectual works, and then these events relating to manuscripts and actors, and also manuscript collections. Okay, so then we have this mapping manuscript migrations portal, which shows five different perspectives on the knowledge graph. So the manuscripts um, perspective here shows a table view of manuscript metadata. And here we have search for Augustine's The City of God, shown on the, on the bottom from the work level. And the work level, as it's not very well harmonized, it's, um, so there is a keyword search or text search for finding the manuscript so, or finding the works of interest. And here you can also see that uh, you actually have uh, sort of different names of work of which some might not actually even even be the city of God, but but that's not important now. Um, yeah, so then we can see the production places of uh, manuscripts based on selection. This is now showing places of of all the manuscripts, so there's no no filtering done on the facets. And you can see like quite uh, specific places, for example, in Italy have produced many manuscripts. Mm. This is the migrations view, which visualizes the actual manuscript migrations from the place of production to the last known location. And here we also have all of the 200 and more than 220,000 manuscripts. So it already becomes a bit messy, but, but it sort of visualizes very well these general trends that, that most of these are produced in Europe and then go, go somewhere else, I guess, or, or moved around in Europe. Uh, so the events view uh, shows around uh, 940,000 events relating to manuscripts and actors. Again, you have table view and map view. Uh, and th this is starting to be already on the limits 
of, of the sample UI and, and well, user interface maybe in general for handling as it uh, has uh, already like a, almost a million uh, events. Uh, actors can similarly be shown as uh, uh, as a table or a map based on the facet selections. And um, yeah, in addition to the portal, there's, um, for, uh, there's an open Sparkle endpoint for doing all kinds of further analysis. Uh, here is this yasgui.org user interface, which is very uh, convenient for making Sparkle queries for, for this and for basically the other samples presented here as well. And you can uh, visualize the results directly with this. So here we are visualizing the, the years of transactions of manuscripts in the Bodleian libraries, uh, which is, is a sort of a, a bit random thing to, to visualize, but just to show an example what can be done. And uh, yeah, so, so as a part of this, this project, we are also having these uh, uh, Sparkle sessions where we sort of um, analyze this data using exactly this tool and try to find interesting things. In. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Uh, here is some, some links and contacts. And if you have any questions, we are happy to answer. Okay, one question, or shall we move on? We are a little bit late of time, so I cannot see any 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 questions in the chat. So perhaps we we take the last session next, and and, and you can also ask ask questions about any samples if you want during the session. So the last session is about letter sample historical letters on the semantic web, and it's also based on international collaborations. And Petri Leskinen will show later sample. Yes. Just like in my previous representation about academic sample, most of this representation will be on the pre recorded video. Can you see the video now? Hopefully yes. you can. Okay. This video introduces the Letter Sample project at the Aalto University and Helsinki Center for Digital Humanities Heldig. We are developing a framework and a demonstrator for publishing and analyzing historical epistolary data in digital humanities based on semantic web technologies. This new project in Finland was inspired by our earlier collaborations with the pan-European EU cost action reassembling the Republic of Letters and the University of Oxford, related to historical letters sent from the 16th to 19th century in Europe and beyond. Letters are always sent from a place to another and are therefore scattered in different archives in different countries, written in different languages. Harmonizing the metadata from separate data silos and aggregating the data into a semantically interoperable global service for digital humanities analyses makes a nice use case for the SAMPO model and SAMPO UI framework, developed at the Semantic Computing Research Group. The SAMPO model includes a collaborative business model for collaborative data publishing in a shared linked data service, the idea of accessing the data from multiple perspectives. The idea of integrating the service seamlessly with data analytic tools for research. And finally, a model for addressing research questions in two steps, where for seated search is first used for filtering out data of interest, and data analysis and visualizations are then applied to it. We next illustrate this idea by showing examples on analyzing letter data by using the letter sample demonstrator. This is the main entry page for the letter sample user interface. The application consists of three perspectives to the underlying data, the actors, the letters, and the places. 
The underlying dataset in this example contains information about a total of 34,000 actors. By actor we mean an individual person or group of people like universities or religious organizations. In the faceted search we can filter or search specific actors by their name, gender, or times of birth or death, or groups of actors for prosopographical research. For example we can search for the mathematician Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. On the result page we will see him among the other matches. The result table shows his years of birth and death and the amount of the letters involved, based on the underlying metadata. On the person landing page we will have even more information about him and his correspondences. In addition to showing his basic biographical information, the page contains fields for his alternative names and vocations. There is a list of all the other actors with whom he has been in contact. It should be emphasized that any visualization or data analysis in a system like Letter Sampo is an analysis of the underlying dataset, not of the real world. Any conclusions drawn from the analysis need source criticism and understanding the limitations of the data. For example, in this example there are 149 letters of Leibniz and the data misses lots of letters. Leibniz was a very active writer with some 15,000 letters and 1,100 correspondence. So in this case only 1% of those are available in the demonstrational dataset. In spite of this, analyzing an incomplete letter collection by distant reading can give novel insights to the researcher and collection manager, and suggest topics of interest for further close reading. The first person on the list is Christian Huygens, with whom he has sent 70 letters. As far as the data can tell us in this case, there are also detailed lists of all letters sent or received by him. The last result on this page shows a list of places he has been active and based on data about sending or receiving letters. The next tab, Network of Letters, shows a visualization of actors' egocentric network. The link width between two actors indicates the amount of mutual correspondence. The wider the link, the more letters has been sent between the two actors. We can like for instance spot that Leibniz sent 39 letters to Christian Huygens while Henry Oldenburg sent more than 200 letters to Huygens. Again, this analysis is based on data about only a fraction of Leibniz's known letters. The next tab illustrates the number of letters on a timeline, where we can observe that the data is based on letters from two periods, the first one in the 1670s, and the second in the 1690s. This could indicate the collection manager that letters in between may be missing. The letter perspective page has a similar faceted search application as the actor page. Here we can browse and filter the data of 162,000 letters by their sender, receiver, date, language, subject, or data source. The second tab on the letter page visualizes the letter routes on a map application. Currently we are viewing the routes of letters sent from Paris. The third tab on the letter page demonstrates the amount of correspondences on a timeline. From this curve can be seen that the data is distributed from 16th to 19th century, with the majority of letters in the 17th century. In addition to the ready-to-use data views in letter sampo, the underlying Sparkle endpoint can be used easily for further data analyses using, for example, Python scripting in Google Collabs. This data table shows the most active mathematicians in the data set, filtered out from the data. The left column shows the actors ranked by the number of letters sent, in the middle column ranking is based by the number of received letters, and on the right by the total amount of letters. The blue text color indicates that the actor has written more letters than what he has received. This is a visualization of the top writers between the years 1620 and 1770, and the ranking of the author is depicted on the y-axis, so that the highest ranking actor appears on the top of the diagram. Based on the underlying collection data, in the 1620s and 1630s Marin Mersenne was at the highest rank, Christian Huygens was among the top writers during the years 1650 to 1690s. Isaac Newton has been an active writer in the late 17th and early 18th century. And finally we have Leonard Euler who's been the top writer during four decades from 1730s to 1760s. Thank you all for watching this video.
More information about the Letter Sample Project is available at the web page of the Semantic Computing Research Group. Okay, that was the video, but I will still show the representation slides very quickly. So we saw already the project video and here are the, to finish with, here are a couple of notes regarding the future research. So parts of future research is the network analysis. We have been in ongoing co cooperation with network analyst researchers, doctoral student Javier Urenia Carrion and Professor Mikko Kivela. The project, what they are doing is comparing historical letter networks with, with mobile, modern mobile communication networks. One future project is to add Finnish epistolary data so that this letter sample actually is a general umbrella project for all kinds of historical letters available. There's this project Epistolarium from Netherlands. It contains about 20,000 letters. And there's a future Intavia EU project which combined intangible and tangible historical data. I will now thank you for listening and it's time for questions. Okay, thank you. There is a question in chat, Petri. Can you yes. see it? I see now. Yes, now regarding letter sample, is there a prospect for integrating cool speech? into data. Yes, it's some project which... Sorry, uh, for search. Um, I misspelled. Yes, I noticed you have the link. That's correct. We could consider that I'm not familiar with this project, but I will most certainly take a look at what it is all about. Yeah, could you could you see I say a, a word about this corps corps mm. search? Um, well, I um, I'm not involved in it, but um, it's it's also an integration project. It's based on the XML um, XML TEI header uh, information. They have their own formats. As far as I know, they they did not um, work on linked open data. Uh, on representing it as linked open data, but it's very very structured and um, so it's it's like another aggregator similar to MLO to what MLO tried to do. Um, so I think both of them will will be very um, strong together. Yes, at the first look, I could say it looks interesting too study further if some cooperation would be possible. Yes, a, a major problem that we have faced in this work is that uh, the letter data uh, is not openly available and, and, and we are now the sort of official public version of letter sample that, that will be published at some point uh, will be based on some subject of, of, of uh, letters that, that, that have an open license. Yeah, because because uh, the letters come from so many different archives and there are so many different licensing policies that these archives have that it's it's very difficult to sort of uh, um, make them available publicly. Yes. So, so that's hopefully something that will change in this this area because it should it should be of everybody's interest that the metadata of the letters are available openly for research. Yes, at least the epistolary data set with 
20,000 letters is available, I think. Yes, the, yes. the dots one, epistolarium. Yes. Okay. Was there another question as well? Mm. Or you have any questions about anything related to today's agenda? We can try to answer. Yes, there was some comments about the manuscript data in the chat which came during my representation. Do you have something more about the MMM project? Okay, but if there are no no uh, questions further, uh, we are we are happy to. If you want, have any questions, please contact any of, of us, and we try to try to uh, answer. And, and uh, we are we are looking eager eagerly for different kind of collaborations with with humanists and other other research groups as well, because this is in the end uh, collaborative work that we are we are doing here, and and uh, and uh, we would welcome any any suggestions for further collaborative research. So I guess we are already over time and I would like to conclude this session and, and thank our, our listeners everywhere in the world. And, and it was very flattering for us that so many of you could join this, uh, this seminar. And uh, all the presentations and the videos that you saw here will be available if they are not already there on the, on the, on the home page of the seminar. So we will also put the, the recording of the whole session there uh, that Mikko is making. So thanks again and, and uh, hope to see you again in, in some of these webinars. There will be actually Heldik Summit. Perhaps I can, I can make an advertisement here. So save the date if you're interested in, 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 in things like digital humanities. Uh, on, on December 11th on Friday, there will be one day seminar on, on Heldik related research. So that might be something that, that uh, many of you have interest in. So welcome there. We will, be, we will put advertisements on our websites on this event next week. Okay, thank you and goodbye.